Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Trust Board uh, February meeting and welcome to everybody who's watching virtually. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time and the interest in our board meeting. Um, uh, really good. So um, if board members are OK, we'll just do the apologies for actions, uh, absence and declarations, and then we'll go straight to our patient story, if that's all right. So, Jenny, I think we've got everybody here, haven't we? No apologies. No apologies, Chair. Thank you. Declarations of interest. You've got the paper and there are some changes this month. If there are any other changes, please let Jenny know. And if there are any items on the agenda where you need to declare an interest, please do so. And if appropriate, um, remove yourself from any discussions on that item. So uh, rather than keep Jean and Mandy waiting, I'd like to start with our patient story, if that's OK. So Jean, welcome to the board. It's lovely to see you here. I think you know a lot of us, obviously, through all your involvement with the trust. And uh, now you're our patient, new patient and carer um, governor as well, which is fantastic. So welcome. So Mandy, would you like to introduce uh, Jean and Jean's story for us? Yes, thank you. So um, I'm introducing Jean Hart, who has come to talk to the board about her journey being, from being involved with trust activities such as research and development, patient care experience activities, amongst others, um, through to recently being appointed as our service user carer governor on the board. So over to you, Jean. Thank you, Mandy. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep this to 15 minutes. We'll give it a go. And uh, could you put this slide up for me, please, Mandy? Yeah, we've got just a few headings on the slide. Just keep me keep me ticking over. Yeah. Can you move it on, please? Slide number two. Can you see that, Jean? No, I can't see it. But can everybody it's, else? It's still on the first slide, Mandy. Okay, I'll move it. Um, I'll do it a different way then. The first slide is just talking about my background, caring for my father. Oh, there we are, Mandy. That's fine. Yeah, lovely. Okay, great. So, in 2006, I found my job role, my full-time job role, impossible due to medical issues and I retired. I was able to spend more time caring for my dad. After my mum died, I, along with my siblings, cared for my father who had mixed dementia. Dad functioned well with regular support from all of us. There were five siblings. However, he seemed to deteriorate quite quickly, not remembering to eat or take medication without prompting. His behaviour became erratic and sometimes irrational. We visited very regularly to try and ensure his safety. Three years later, he went into residential care and I developed a life story scrapbook for Dad to help with his care plan. The care home seemed to advocate drugs to manage Dad's distress rather than in establishing the cause. My my twin sister and I raised concerns, which prompted a second opinion and Dad's medication was changed. Over the years in the care home, Dad was admitted to hospital nine times. We were advised that he was too ill to move to a nursing home. Dad's last visit to the hospital, he remained there and died two weeks later on his 12th of November 2010. 11 days before his 94th birthday. These had been hard times with four siblings, um, my four siblings, having expressed different perspectives during dad's illness. Burnt out after his death in 2010, I took a rest to play golf and as part of our healing process as a family, I updated dad's storybook to tell the individual life story of my, each of my siblings. Can I put this up? Can you see it? Yeah. We can, Jane. Yes. Oh, lovely. Well, I just wanted to show you the next page. Oh, no, there's two of us. The other one is my twin. <laughs> right. Uh, so 
the stories are individual to each of us. Um, and it was very much a healing process. Um, as I mentioned, there was hard times there, very sad. Um, ironically, my twin sister Janet works work before retirement for many years for as a microanalyst with AstraZeneca. There's another story, eh? Next slide, please, Mandy. My background to my career then. I worked for the career service for over 28 years. And during that time, I was also a trustee for Hull City Council Voluntary Service. Um, a role I undertook for 10 years. My work activities focused on working with disengaged teenagers, community development and outreach work. I spent two years leading a multidisciplinary post-16 educational research project on two housing estates in North Hull. A two inch thick report of our findings was submitted to the Holmberside County Council. But this little book here, it's called A Prize Beyond Belief. That's the reference to a resident. It's very special to me. A local resident volunteer she was with the project, quite prolific in her activities. She used to write little ditties and leave them on my desk. They described all sorts of things she'd been doing. And for her 50th birthday, I arranged for this a local business to print this book um, to sponsor its publication. She is now a trustee of the Goodwin Centre, same age as me, a social enterprise agency close to the city centre, probably you'll know it. My husband and I also fostered teenagers around that time when I was working. And the last six years of my career, I worked as a trainer for professionals and was contracted to work with the university staff as a co-trainer on the Connections training programme for personal advisors. The interest in me as a trainer was the fact that I worked with Disengage for so long. When in 2006, I mentioned earlier, I found my job real impossible to do because of my medical issues. My hearing had been damaged. The higher register impaired after an accident, so I found it difficult to hear women and young people. I taught effective listening. I mentioned earlier I found my job role impossible to do because of my own medical issues. Um, I was forced into retirement and it was quite a problem. It was quite traumatic. My work had defined me because Chris and I have no children of our own. But then I was then able to spend more time caring for dad. His illness was long and painful uh, and the process lasted 14 years. Slide four, uh, four please, Monday. Now, so we're talking now about the, my involvement in research. Six years after dad died in 2006, I became a City of Culture volunteer, performing mainly a meet and greet role. This gave me back my confidence in dealing with the public and more importantly, my positivity. I met a poet at the Humber Street Gallery, a chap called Jim McGregor, who lives in Scotland. More about him later. In 2017, I ventured back into voluntary work in support of people with dementia. With my help, the research team at the University of Hull identified 200 people for across the Hull and East Riding area living with the condition. They would be willing to take part in a European wide study called Caregivers Pro. The project successfully developed a social media platform providing information and support to people with dementia and their carers. The project lead, Dr. Emma Wilson, was a, the Alzheimer's Society Prize winner, the first female, I think, in its history. That was in 2019. During that time, I registered as a volunteer with the Humber Teaching Trust, Foundation Trust, to support uh, the work of the research and development team. I worked in collaboration with the university. Initially, it was the, uh, that relationship with the Caregivers Pro pilot that brought me to them. When it ended, I was involved in signposting the research participants to local support groups within the voluntary sector. This drew me to the volunteer 
to volunteer for the whole library links reading rooms program supporting vulnerable people they're such fun and full of laughter and jim mcgregor has recently published his latest book i think he's done about 11. he does poetry i wrote one uh you know back in 2017 um about my dad it was called two companions i love reading recently online with the alsam support groups as part of the reading rules project and i read that poem to them they loved it it's very poignant and funny i also joined the older people's partnership for holonese riding that group a vibrant network of local charities and community groups i promote other dementia research programs through my broad network working amongst community groups across the whole and East Riding area. Slide five, please, Mandy. Uh, this is the last slide. My involvement with patient and care and experience in volunteering. I've been on the Alzheimer Society National Work Research Volunteer since 2018. There are 280 of us nationally, former career carers and people living with dementia have a unique voice being expert, experts by their experience. I assessed my first grant applications on behalf of the Alzheimer's Society in 2019. Through networking at the East Riding Carers Advisory Group, I met Mandy Dawley, Head of Patient Care Experience and Engagement. I have to smile when she's always got one and she makes me smile too. My first activity with the patient carers experience team involved sitting on a stakeholder panel for a series of interviews. Since then, I've been on many stakeholder panels for corporate service roles and corporate services roles. I am passionate that interviews are value based. Well, I would be, wouldn't I, with my background in the career service. I'm a regular member of the Patient Carers Forums and a champion of patient and carer experience. I give input to special, specific pieces of work in the team by attending working groups. Recently, I volunteered for the Trust COVID-19 Vaccination Hub, a role I very much enjoyed. None more evident when I was interviewed on film for the NHS Humber Internet, I said, Volunteering for the Vaccination Hub, there's nothing more important. A role I very much enjoyed, uh, as I've said. Um, I said it was very, very much important. None more evident, this is the key one, um, when I said, unlike clapping in support of the NHS or banging in a pan with a spoon, this is tangible. Any questions? Oh, by the way, can I just say, um, I meant to put this at the bottom of this. Michelle, if you fancy a game of golf, I'm your woman. I warn you though, I've played golf for Cottingham Parks in the Yorkshire League for over 14 years. Get ready. You're, oh. you're, on, you're on with that then, Jean. I'll certainly do that and I'll invite you to our charity golf day when we ever <laughs> get back to it. So you're on with that, absolutely. All right. I'm going to get my sticks out again then, aren't I? <laughs> OK. Me, me too, me too. Yeah. Have you got any questions then? I'm sure there will be some questions and comments, Jane. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And I don't think you do yourself justice, Jane, with how much actually you do contribute to the Trust, to be quite honest. Um, I think you've been very modest um, with that, I have to say. Even from my experience of you personally, I know that doesn't really do it justice, how much time you put in. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, comments going in the chat box, Jean, as well. For, so we'll start. Any questions or comments for Jean, please? Oh, right. I think there's a... Uh, oh, Michelle? <laughs> Yeah, I, I promise I won't, I won't mention golf, but, but first of all, thank you for that. That is just great, um, great that you're involved in this. People now are really, really um, interested and, and um, passionate about research, and it's something that the organisation do, do, does really, really well and, and, and is increasing that, and I thank to Catherine and, and to everybody, and yourself, Jean. I was just wondering how, and you touched on it a little bit, but how we could link in some of your vast experience with patients and, and families and communities into our research research 
issues uh, our research services within the organization but also wider because i also chair the clinical research network and we've got a really good strong uh, patient participation network and i was just wondering maybe as mandy as well how we linking into that um with such experience and, and such um interest and especially around dementia which is so important so i just wondered how we were how we were doing that if we could help or if we could do a little bit better on that well um we've got a, a story waiting on someone who's come through the Caregivers Pro project and all the things she's been involved in since. Right. As I was Shirley, um, it's been through the um, research team, Catherine Hart's up the handle on it. It's been done and then it got stopped by COVID. So, I mean, that is one way, because obviously what I'm looking at is trying to engage with Shirley and the uh, PACE um, team. Um, and I think that's a really good route because we get people through to the forums and all that sort of stuff. Very keen on that. I'm very bottom up. And I've seen I've seen a lot of stuff um, going on nationally with webinars by people with dementia running webinars, running, running courses. The latest, we've just got one in East Riding, haven't we, with Wendy Mitchell waving the flag, running a course with other people. So lots to do, loads of ideas. OK. Thanks, Jane. Next one is Lynn, please. Good morning, thanks. Jack. Good morning, Jean. Good to see you again. So, great story. Thanks so much for a wealth of information. I guess my question is a bit similar to Michelle's, really. So, with all your experience and all the contacts you have with the trust, I guess is there anywhere that you think, um, Jean, that we are sort of missing a trick a bit? Things that we could be doing more of, or should be doing more of, or should be thinking and focusing on that you've observed? Well, it's obvious I'm a talker. <laughs> I, I think it's also important to listen. And we have to find ways in which we can do that. Now, on the 3rd of March, I've been invited by the North Bank Forum to their engagement. I had a choice. Could I go in the strategic group on the 10th of March or go into the community groups on the 3rd of March? You know what I've chosen. It's the 3rd. I'm going to be in there with the groups, as many as are there, and we're going to be talking about building back after COVID. And with these community groups and I'll be banging the drum there. I don't have a, well, I do have a community group I'm involved in. I haven't mentioned this, but you know, the, these are the things, that, the networking uh, and, and building the relationship. People won't come to us in the trust unless they have a relationship. It might be that they're angry over something that hasn't worked well for them, and they'll come and bang a drum on that. But but to come and and work with and shape it, well, that takes a bit of courage. And I think, you know, you've got to build the relationships first. Really Thanks, good. Lynn. Thank you. Thanks, Len. John? Oh, he's on mute. I think you're on mute, John. <laughs> oh, have we lost him? Oh. I think just while we wait for John, um, I've just got a question as well. I, well, it's more of a comment, really, Jean. I think you're one of the first um, people, not the only one, but it, it's a great thing that you've come through all the involvement with the trust, the research and the PACE groups to become a governor. And I think this is something we really need to build on. And I know Michelle Hughes, you're working with the membership group with the governors, aren't you? And I think it's really important that that link with um, the patient and care experience and the research teams and membership um, is strengthened because, you know, we need governors like you, Jean, that have had experience and that want to make a difference and help us improve things. So um, I think it's it's really encouraging that you've come through to be a governor from that route. So thank you for that. Uh, John, have we got you back? Yeah, I'll try my Biggles headset. Can you hear me now? Yes. We, yes, no, we can. Much better. I'm learning from Dean. Um, so, so, Jean, I just want to say thank you very much. I won't ask you what your banded golf handicap is, but whatever it is, I'd add a few shots on before you play, Michelle. Uh, we won't tell. Um, very quickly, I, I just wanted to say um, thank you for your support around the vaccination programme. Um, and I think if one thing we've learned is the power of volunteerism over COVID, and that's one thing that we've managed to do really well as a trust throughout the COVID period is work with our um, volunteers who've actually become colleagues and partners over the year. Um, and we would never have been successful. I think, I think we I lost just, you again at the end there, John. Sorry. respond to that, John. I brought two other people with me because, as you know, um, Sharon Nobbs 
volunteer coordinator was scouting around in, in a bit of a panic to get the thing up. And I brought two, two people with me from other groups. Great. Uh, because they're in there now. And finally, let me say, the senior there saw me just outside on the last shift. And she'd seen me on the internet. <laughs> she'd come outside. She'd oh, Jean, I didn't know you was here. She said, I would have brought the Oscar. <laughs> just thought that was fabulous. <laughs> so isn't that lovely? I hate jabs, but I got one. So that was lovely. I'm, I was ahead of the field. Super. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic, Jean. Absolutely fantastic. Well, can I just say, um, just, as I say, please do read the comments later in the chat box, Jean, um, because there's some fantastic comments uh, about you and your contribution and your golf as well, to be fair. Um, but can I thank you and thanks, Mandy, for coming and supporting Jean. But Jean, thank you for all that you've done and in advance for all that you're going to do and contribute. Your energy and enthusiasm is absolutely infectious. And uh, you do generously contribute of your own time to improve things for others. And it really is appreciated, Jean. So thank you very much. And thank you for coming this morning. Can we got, a, can we got a short, thank you, just to read from the book, just a, just two or three lines. Okay. I, I'm showing off now. It's called To Question. It's Britain by this lady who's uneducated, right? I have a friend, she's only small, but has the strength of 10, a heart of gold, head full of sense. She lifted me when I was down. She stirred me on when all I, when I felt all was hope was gone. She gave me her strength, her knowledge. She tried to help me see good in everyone. But most of all, she gave me back the will to question and never always to accept. Jean, I hope you always be my friend. She's the governor of the Goodwin. Wow. <laughs> That's fantastic, Jane, and, and yeah, just very, very powerful and wonderful. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, it's been a joy to have you at the board, Jean, and um, a lovely way to start off our board meeting. So thank you very much thank for everything. You. Yeah, I'm clearing off now, right? OK. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jean. Bye. Well, what a fantastic way to start the board meeting. And aren't we lucky to have Jean now as a, a governor with us on the Council of Governors? So that's really fantastic. So if we could go, please, Matt, to item three, which is the minutes of the meeting held in January. Are there any points of accuracy that you've not already let Jenny know? Are there any actions that are not on the actions log? No. Well, we'll take those as a true record then. Thank you. Uh, so if we can move on to item four, which is the actions log. Um, any questions on that? No, I think um, the various emails and things were circulated one went round yesterday, so that's good. OK, so if we could move on then, we've had the wonderful story from Jean at item five. So if we can move on to item six, which is my chair's report. Um, it, since the last uh, board meeting, I did attend the first national well-being staff well-being event, uh, which was to introduce the role of the national uh, the, of the role. But unfortunately, yet, as yet, there's no national guidance on. But I am working with Katie in um, Steve's team um, to try and work through that and see what the role in, involves. And as you know, Dean is going to be the, the deputy uh, well-being guardian as well. So I'll keep you up to speed with that as that develops. Um, in terms of meetings and external partners and stakeholders, um, very busy time, as you would expect. So um, lots going on in the system, which I know Michelle will touch on later and as mentioned in her report. Um, predominantly concentrating, as you would expect, on the new legislation and the potential changes in the system. The Humber Advisory uh, Board, which is the Humber partnership that half the geographical patch, uh, the chair's um, advisory group is very much concentrating on health inequalities at the moment. So that's really interesting. And uh, of, also I've attended the um, Health and Wellbeing Board and uh, there's a workshop on tomorrow, I think, which Michelle is co-presenting um, um, on. So Michelle and I have continued to meet with um, Gwen Lunn and Alison Barker from Hull City Council, and I've continued meeting um, and discussing various matters with fellow chairs, such as Tom Hunter from Navigo and also Terry Moran from Huth. 
So internally, um, it's that time of year again. So I've been going around quite a lot of the subcommittees, um, as I do at least once a year. So thank you very much to um, the chairs and members of those committees. And I think it's been fantastic to see the strong links that exist between the various um, board subcommittees. And it really is uh, good to see that live governance in action rather than just sort of paper. So that's fantastic. In terms of the governors, you'll have seen from Jean, uh, the new governors have started on the 1st of February and we did an induction for them. And thank you for those of you who popped into induction. I think that went quite well. And um, there was also, um, Michelle hosted with others, uh, a session for the governors on mental health, learning disabilities and autism and the patient pathway. And there's going to be community um, services version of that. I think it's on the 22nd of March, if anybody wants to pop into that. So that would be really welcome. We've had some great feedback from that session. Um, and as I said, we're going to build on that. So I think that's all, unless anybody's got any questions. No. So can we move on to item seven, Chief Executive Report, Michelle? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Good morning, everybody, and, and welcome. And um, obviously, people have got my report to have a look at. I'll pick out, as usual, just a couple of things and then I'll throw it open to questions. Um, we've put the slavery policy um, statement in there as required, and that will go on to our website. So it's there very clearly set out. Um, we've also I've also put in there a safety update this month for um, just just to give us a bit of a, a, an update on health and safety and fire because I signed the annual fire statement this year and I always meet with the fire officer before I sign that so I thought it was useful just to um, update the board on the work I know we get it through other assurance routes but I just thought I'd clarify just some of the work that's in progress and I do thank everybody for, for their work on, on everything across the organisation because you know we are motoring on, on everything as we continue to develop our journey. And um, there's a little bit of an update on the inpatient build. We had a very positive meeting with the ICS and with Region uh, about where we were up to on that. Um, and that's really positive. Obviously, we are waiting to see what's going to happen nationally with any national funds. But at least we're getting that really up the uh, priority list in relationship to the region. And with my ICS hat on, we'd seen how all that fits with the integrated care system and the general layout of mental health and learning disability services. So that's really positive. Um, there is the North Yorkshire update, because obviously there's a devolution consultation that's out for North Yorkshire. Um, there's something has come in since the report was done, which has gone out to board members for comments. So Michelle Hughes is facilitating that for me. There's a brief update on the system, which we'll touch on later with the appointments from the Integrated Care Partnerships with um, Amanda, uh, Amanda Blow in North Yorkshire and York and Emma Latimer in the Humber. So that's building on the geographical partnerships and it's a really positive, uh, really positive for us that, 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 that they're beginning to really start to develop and, and develop our agenda in relationship to uh, the ICS. Um, I, I will ask Hillary to come on to the CQC. It's in Hillary's report, but obviously we had the the um, visit from CQC. I think we've already fed back some of that, but it was really positive. I have fed back nationally and regionally the fact that we don't get a formal report on that. Um, and I think after all the work that, that people put in, we, we should get something, but, but Hillary will give you the, the, some of the feedback that we've had. But can I take this opportunity to thank everybody for their work on that? Because we could have deferred it um, because there were no risk flags for the organisation, but we felt it was useful to go ahead with that meeting. And I think it was really positive um, as, a, as a stock take. But thank you, everybody in the middle of a pandemic to do that. I know Mike's got his hand up, so I'll, 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 come, I'll come on to that. Is it on the, this point, Mike? OK, um, so, th so that, that's really positive. I will hand over to, to, to that. Um, the, I've done a detailed update for the um, Academic Health Science Network. because Again, I thought it was useful to just remind ourselves that the Academic Health Science Network is there and we do link into that. And in fact, I'm working quite closely now with the um, HSNN, the Health Academic Science Network, with the clinical research hat on just to see how we can start to link those two, not together formally, but how we can start to develop an innovation hub within Humber Coast and Vale. Um, so, so that's just there for, uh, uh, as an update. We've got the Guardian of Safe Working Now, which is really positive that we've got that post filled. Um, and thank you to, to, to John for, for that. Um, and lots and lots from communication, the, vis the visible um, branding is going down really well. We can see it in, in operation today, but we've seen the presentation from June, really fresh, get some really positive feedback. So I thank comms, um, Rachel, Adam, et cetera, and everybody else involved with that. 
Also, the patient portal is there now, which again is another positive benefit for the organisation. And we continue to develop our website and intranet. And um, we did circulate and we will put onto the, the website and the internet the Whitbay video that gives people a bit of an update on the development because obviously we haven't been able to go out as often as we would do to have a look at that due to the lockdown and the pandemic but it's really good to see that really taking shape now um, and Doff one of our governors up at Whitbay did a really great piece in there and I thank Doff as well it was a real starring performance um, and we've done it a publicity shoot I think is the word now I'm getting all the lingo with the comms team um, in relationship to publicising that and we're also starting to do and I thank Mike and others for the charitable funds work that we're doing in developing that um, charitable funds specifically for WIP for those added touches and added sparkle as we call it like we did with Inspire. Um, there is a Health Stars update in the paper but I'll leave it there Chair there's a lot in there from the directors there's a lot happening I think that's really commendable given the fact that we're in a pandemic that we've still got a lot of business as usual there's a lot happening in relationship to transformation money's coming in to increase our services and develop our services so I thank every member of staff not just the transformation but all the work they're doing and I still get around with the visible teams and the virtual teams um, staff are tired but are still absolutely maintaining their quality of care um, we are ensuring that staff get um, get, get holidays and we're monitoring that and in fact we've just done a big communication on giving staff a birthday holiday so we've um, uh, we've been we've been giving staff a, a little reward and thank you to, to value them all the way through the pandemic we've done something every month this month was just to celebrate their birthday so we've given them an extra um, uh, uh, annual leave day to take on or around their birthday specifically on or around their birthday just to hopefully as we get through the lockdown through this to be able to spend it more closely with friends and family because it's been a particularly difficult year for everybody so I will stop there chair because I just think there's just so much happening um, I, I wanted to briefly pass on to Hillary just to give us a bit I know we've had a little bit of this but just to give us a little bit of a, a flavour of the feedback from the CQC if that's okay Hillary but then I'll throw it open to questions thanks Michelle yeah so it's in the report is a very positive feedback we got from the CQC when they looked at over 23 key lines of inquiry with us um, we've really prepared, obviously, and we've got some fantastic examples, which they obviously fed that back to us that they were very good examples, particularly around partnership working, uh, safeguarding, working with our patients, carers, etc. So it's all in, in Michelle's report there. Um, they, they said they, we obviously know what where we need to, to develop further, which is around equality and diversity. She says you know what you've got to do, and it's obviously getting on with it. So there was there was absolutely no no criticism of anything. It felt like all of those key lines of inquiry were met, and this is going to be their style going forward. And we'll sit down with them um, when they request it to look at any of the key lines of inquiry where they can't get the information from other sources to give them an idea of, of compliance. So it, it felt very positive, and I know that everybody that was involved in that meeting actually enjoyed it. It felt quite cathartic, I think, after the year that we've had been able to sort of talk about the journey and recognise that actually, given the pressures that we've had over the last few months, some of the fantastic work that has been delivered across, whether it's the divisions or corporate services, we have still continued to develop the services, as Michelle says, do the quality improvement stuff and really meet the needs of our patients, which given in a, a, uh, the pandemic, those, those needs have changed, like that context has changed, yet yeah, it's like we've kept that one step ahead of it and been able to keep delivering. And I think that that really came through. And I know at the end of it, Lynn and I were through, sat there through the whole thing, and obviously we contributed as well. And at the end of it, we said, well, that would, the, our teams were just fantastic. Uh, we were absolutely amazed. And some of the examples that we, even we didn't know about what they'd been doing. Uh, and I think it's a credit to them. Thank you, Hilary. That's fantastic. So I've got uh, quite a few hands up. Before I go to the non-execs, are there is any other exec directors wish to add? Uh, Michelle Hughes? Thank you, Chair. If I could just add to the communication section, as everybody knows, it was Mental Health Nurses Day on Sunday, uh, which we obviously celebrated, but we had so much fantastic content. Um, we've extended the campaign for a whole week. The focal point is an intranet page that's been created where staff can find profiles and a useful resources list. And we've had lots of uh, media interest, uh, radio, TV and print. So that's uh, fantastic and ongoing for the rest of the week. 
Um, the intranet, following the success of the redeveloped website, which has been a fantastic success, and we've got the stats to, to back that up, uh, work has started to move the intranet to an up-to-date platform, which will de uh, deliver significant improvements to the site flow and user experience. So a lot of work going on in the team with regards to that with the launch date of the end of May. And just finally, another piece of work that's in progress is a, uh, a bespoke online welcome website for our new starters, so that when they arrive, there's lots of work going on to recruit and that's fantastic, but once they actually get here, there'll be a site to um, provide a one-stop shop for everything you might need to know, forms for the trust and local knowledge. So that, that's a, another exciting piece of work that's underway. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. That's really helpful. And as you say, just loads going on. Very positive. I saw um, quite a few of those. I saw the one on Tracy Flanagan. It was really positive, really Fantastic. quite moving, actually. Really good. Um, so thank you for that. So I'll go to questions now. So Mike Cook. Thank you, Sharon. Good morning, everybody. And uh, Michelle Moran, thank you for the uh, overview and the work you're doing in the system, as well as our own organisation. And uh, uh, for to Hillary and Michelle Hughes for supplementing that. I suppose um, the main comment is, um, as reflected by the CQC, um, in a transitional visit at a really busy time, that we're sticking to the knitting, i.e. doing the things we need to do every day, the ordinary as well as extraordinary things for patients, responding to COVID brilliantly uh, and continuously and uh, and the vaccination program has been uh, truly outstanding, uh, as well as the approach to infection control. And I'll come back to that. Um, and also that we're being a proactive partner. So well done to all of you as a team. And um, just to be specific on, on 4.11 on the Chief Operator Lynn's report, community nursing in Scarborough, to see that separate service evolving now is a really good way to go. And, you know, we probably should have done it a while ago, but, you know, now we're, we're getting on with things and working out how post-COVID things are beginning to uh, work through. And that's a, a hard area to manage, I know, and uh, I'm really pleased with the progress there. I thought the CQC feedback, Hilary, thank you for sharing that um, at Quality Committee as well as here and, uh, and in our updates. Um, that's really positive and uh, we should be proud that we've locked in uh, yet more progress, uh, you know, and including the white ribbon update. That's fantastic. Uh, Hillary leading on that, too. Um, can I just commend the the progress we've made on the uh, medical education front? I think Stella Morris has transformed that with support from John Byrne and uh, uh, I think she should be commended. I think we're in a different place on that. And we need to really think carefully how we push on beyond that, uh, perhaps with Stella still involved in some way, perhaps mentoring and coaching and supporting things. Um, uh, really nice to see Steve's good wide progress report too on all the workforce and organisation development issues. Really important time to, to push on now. And, and I think we're ready uh, to move forward. So thank you for that. Uh, and two policies commended. They're just the sort of areas we need to stay really sharp on, you know, restrictive interventions at this time and also um, immunisation and vaccination. So keeping those bang up to date with the latest things. So really, really good report. Thank you all very much indeed for what you're doing. Um, and I, I just wanted to say it in that way. Thanks very much, Mike. Really appreciate it. Uh, John, I'll come to you um, first, if I may. Uh, so just very quickly, just want to commend uh, everyone who was involved in the flu vaccination programme. Um, a figure of 76% is actually our highest ever in the trust. Um, and not only that, it was achieved in half the time that we would normally do it. So we had to do that over a 10 week period. Um, so a big thank you to all of the peer vaccinators who, who did that. And without that, peer vaccinating cohort, we'd never been able to sort of roll out the COVID vaccine as successfully as we've done. Um, and I think we've learned both from both loads from both programmes in terms of taking it forward into next year. Because um, the flu vaccine was always going to be a diff difficult sell this year. 
um, because of the actual COVID vaccine and the gaps and stuff. So uh, I think for people to deliver um, that quantity of vaccine across all of our sites, bearing in mind the amount of positive remote working we've been doing to get to that figure of 76% in a, an organisation with so many sites that we have was, was no mean feat. So um, well done to all of those people involved. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Dean? Thank, thanks very much. I, I, Mike Cook has said most of what I was going to say. It was um, uh, just echoing what Mike said and um, uh, recognising for both Sharon and Michelle, you know, just that in terms of um, uh, not only sort of continue to run the organisation, do all the things that we should be doing, but doing it to, uh, uh, you know, contributing to the broader system and uh, stakeholders. And I know how hard that is when you're trying to do that sort of virtually, as well as keep on top of, you know, all the sort of COVID requirements of reporting and an update with things. But yeah, it just echoes in that in the paper, uh, from Gail, but also the, the full set of papers today, uh, I think, show sort of progress on a range of uh, issues across the uh, the organisation. And, and just to agree with Michelle, really, about um, I, I, I think you're right, Michelle, to uh, to raise with the CQC about a written feedback. You know, as as a board, we're constantly looking, aren't we, for triangulation and assurance uh, that things are happening as we hope that they're happening. And um, the reviews from external uh, partners and regulators are so important to that. Uh, sort of coming and uh, relying on sort of verbal updates as good as that has been um, doesn't feel as good as getting some sort of written assurance uh, for that so um, I think it's right to ask the CQC to reflect on the approach that they're taking there but thanks very much for the update. Thank you Dane, really useful. Uh, Francis? Thank you Chair and again you know Mike has said a lot of what I was going to uh, talk about I'm really impressed with the Scarborough community nursing piece which is excellent to see that couple of minor questions one was on the um on the uh white ribbon which is fantastic just out of interest is is there a version the other way around for abuse of men by women no i think you're aware no not that i'm aware of uh, no. So um, can I just answer that, actually? I, I think in fairness, Fra Francis, the white ribbon is inclusive and it does acknowledge all forms of um, domestic abuse. Um, although we need to recognise as men that we are culpable for 90 percent of the abuse. So in fairness to the white ribbon campaign and the people behind it, they are aware that it's a it's a broad church. Um, but there is something about uh, men realising that actually most of the abuse um, is caused by us. I, I get that, John. I just wondered if there was a, a flip side to it because there is some does happen. Great. Yeah, nice. no, there is. Uh, there is, and it's built into the program. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Sorry, Francis, if I could just just add to that. Obviously, as a trust, we do recognise um, about domestic violence on with on to men, females to males as well. So it's uh, it's within our strategies as well. So it's not that we're just focusing on on the female side. No, no, it's fine. It wasn't criticism. It was just about out of interest yeah. to see yeah. if there was a, if there was a. OK, the yeah. second one was on the academic um, health science network and just wondering if we'd made any use of there's a lot of really good IT stuff in there by the looks of it. I just wondered if we have made any use of any of those uh, tools that have been talked about in here. Shall I pick some of that up? I don't know if John wants to come in as, as, as IT. We, we, we are, I think some of it, we've just started to really understand what what the, you know, what they're actually working at and what have you. So we've dipped, to answer the question, we've dipped into some of them, but there's more that we need to do, Francis. And I think it's really good now we're getting those better established links with the AHSN. So um, so yes, to some, we, I think, I'm just having a look. I think there's, there's a couple that we're just looking at, both as a trust in the system, but we do need to do more. Great, because there's stuff like the quick prioritisation tool on my leadership strengths. I don't know if Steve's had a look at that and if it's any use to us. And there's a couple around GP networks that look interesting. Just you, They just seem interesting things that we could maybe learn from, that was all. Absolutely. Yeah, we're on with it. We're now we're fully aware and we're fully linked in. We're, we're on to it a lot more than we were. I think both as a, a trust and also as an ICS as well, to be fair, Francis. Great. OK, thanks. That was it. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. Uh, really good. Uh, really good report. Um, Michelle, as you say, so much going on, which is a credit to you all and everybody, actually, in the still dealing with the current situation. So thank you very much for that. So could we move on, please, to item eight, which is, oh, sorry, before I go, um, we need to ratify the policies, don't we? So the two policies on pages 37 and 38 of your pack, are we happy to ratify those policies? Yes. Any dissensions? No, duly ratified. Thank you. If we move on, please, to item eight, then staying with you, Michelle, please. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Again, I won't I won't go into this in detail. It is there. It's all the national publications. Um, 
a lot a lot of it is work we're already um doing the directors have put their relevant uh, bits i think what's the important bit is, is that is the covid recovery and resilience and, and and what we can do in the king's fund report just to say that we have had some really detailed discussions in the executive team about sort of next stages for recovery restoration whenever that happens in relationship to staff and they will continue and this is a bit about, you know, uh, continuing to support staff, but maybe in a slightly different way. So, um, so I'll just just say that. But it's there, chair, and that's just for questions. Thank you, Michelle. Any questions on this paper? No, thank you. It's a useful paper to get each time. So, thank you very much for that. Um, item nine, performance report. And I know, Pete, you've circulated. Um, uh, sort of revised uh, version round. So if you could just pick that up as as well, that'd be really useful. So over to you, Pete. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So as normal, this is the usual performance report and takes us to the end of January. So reporting our month 10 performance. You'll see the commentary in the front sheet for those indicators outside of normal variation. There's just a couple of points I'd like to pull out, if I may, before we go into questions. So firstly, we'll note that cash has improved in month, and that's due to some capital drawdown and non-recurrent funding received from commissioners. We are expecting a dip in our cash in March, because as I've reported to the board previously, there'll be no block income in March, but there will be an offsetting of that for some additional capital that will be drawing down between now and the end of the year that the cash will probably leave the bank account in quarter one. So we probably won't see the dramatic dip in March that we were expecting, but we will probably see a dip in cash in quarter one of 21-22. And then just in terms of the safer staffing dashboard chair, we've recirculated the dashboard because we identified yesterday there was an error in the number of reported violence and aggression incidents. So I'd like to thank Hillary's team for reviewing the data and identifying that. You know, the changes have resulted of, you know, and an increase in figures still. So the increase is now 41% as opposed to the figure in the board report. And I think if I hand over to Hillary at this point, just to talk about the work Hillary has instigated into looking into that data and then move on to other questions, if I may. OK, thank, thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, so when I looked at the violence and aggression incidents, I was concerned, particularly about the number of PQ ones. And then when I looked at the year before, so there's been a considerable increase in, in the PQ numbers. So um, 75 more incidents compared to the same time last year uh, for PQ. Uh, overall, we've got 100 and, uh, 137 more violence and aggression incidents in our inpatient units. But I think Orion uh, obviously wasn't um, open to the December date for last year, so that wouldn't have been in the figures last year. So that's accounted for 20 of those 137 more. But I do think we need to do a bit of work on it. So I'm just going to commission a little piece of work just to look at these violence and aggressions in the inpatients, comparing with the year before, the numbers, the harm, uh, police involvement, restraint used, COVID-related themes, things like that, smoking-related themes, just to try and unpick it a little bit and see, you know, is there something there tangible that we can do something to try and reduce these numbers? Um, because it's mainly the PQ one that's driving it, but the, most of the units have got a slight increase in, the, in those incidents as well. So I think it's a really good time just to have a look at it. Thanks, Hilary. OK, we'll go to questions. Thank you both. Uh, we'll start with um, Mike Cook. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and thanks for the report. What I liked about the report was I, I went to incidents and waiting lists uh, and there was a bigger commentary. So I, I really appreciate the commentary on this report. I think a fuller commentary really helps the discussion. Um, just if I may, uh, on, on incidents, when the original report, we're thinking, actually, it's, it, there aren't too many trends here yet. We need to look at it. I just wonder if it is a bit of overheating, a bit of um, people presenting late, but actually quite ill um when they're admitted uh and, and a, just a combination of you know staff being a bit tired and covid fatigue if you like i, I just sense there's there is a bit of a um, set of ingredients that that may just be behind a a bit of a pulse of this so i think if you could look at that that would be really helpful and perhaps we can take it back to quality committee yeah. and uh, mental health ledge and have a have a look at it just just some thoughts Yes. Thank you. So uh, if there are any other comments on waiting time, I'm keen to hear those. But thanks for the update on incidents, too. That's really helpful. 
Thanks, Mike. I've got some other hands up, but Lynn, this is probably a good time to bring you in for a usual update on waiting times because it's a bit of a mixed picture in this month, isn't it? There's some really positive um, indications and directions and there's some that are not so positive. Um, so, And uh, obviously the report refers to the external work that you've been having done as well. So if you could update us on waiting lists particularly, that'd be really useful. Then I'll take the rest of the questions, Lynn, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. So, yes, the, um, the reports are somewhat encouraging in some areas. If you look at the RTT, um, completes and incompletes, they're both going in the right direction, which is good news. But I guess the area that still stands out is particularly children's and children's ASD. So that was an area that the external consultants were asked to particularly focus in. So um, and that um, detailed work actually has been really helpful in shining further light on really what the data is telling us around that area. So obviously one key area of focus, unsurprisingly, is, you know, really understanding the demands coming in through that service, particularly for children's autism, the resource that we've got available, the new appointment slots that we've got each month to accommodate that um, demand. And undoubtedly, there has been uh, work that we've needed to do to align that resource um, better to meet that incoming demand. We've also um, reached out to other service areas um, across our ICS patch who have done better, um, if I'm honest, through COVID in relation to autism diagnosis particularly. And what that has shown us is that other areas are making better use of um, virtual pathways digital interventions than we have been doing and I think that's really understandable from our clinicians point of view um, I think there, you know that there is a growing positive evidence base that we really asked our commission uh, clinicians to to focus on and our plan going forward is based on the evidence that we've seen we are going to be utilizing uh, more of the digital opportunities to resolve um, the waiting times that we've got at the moment. The Deputy Chief Operating Officer actually um, is working with this service very closely, bringing all of her expertise, particularly around waiting times. So actually over the last month, there has been um, a lot of um, underlying work that I think is really important. Um, but I know, you know, quite rightly, I'm also impatient. I know the board is to to see those numbers going in the right direction. But I am, you know, confident with the work that we've been doing. It has been very intensive. It has been about system processes, but it has also been really about understanding the clinician's perspective and really getting those clinicians on board um, with these changes that we're going to make further to uh, to see some improvement there. Obviously, we continue to work very closely with our commissioners too. The autism pathway, you know, it's a really important pathway, but it doesn't just start with us um, either. So there's further work that we've engaged with, with the clinician, with the commissioners too, um, around this area. So um, I do think we're on the right path with this. I think we will see those numbers improve over the coming months and we have got a better sort of understanding of the data and information to to support that now. Thanks, Lynn. And just on that, sub oh, Michelle, do you want to add before I ask my question on this subject? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, please. I mean, it's not just necessarily about um, CAMS waiting list, it's about children and young people in general. And Lynn touched on it just to say from a system point of view, it is a real regional, it's a, well, it's a trust issue, it's a regional issue, but it's also a national issue. So we are doing a lot of work together as a system on, on CAMS, but also with the local authority as well. And, and I've um, uh, chaired a couple of meetings now with all the, the chief officers and all the chief um, leads in relationship to children and young people across the patch. A lot of it is around tier four, which is obviously the inpatient high acuity piece, but we are looking at how we can stop the, you know, the the, the, the progression, I think, into, into that um, high acuity, so the lower preventative type work. And we're also going to be looking to utilise, if, you, if you're aware, there's 500 million that, that's coming next to mental health services across across England and we're looking to develop bids and opportunities to develop that and one of those will be around waiting list initiatives but it'll also it'll be around eating disorders because specific pressures in eating disorders as well 
one of the things that has been really positive that will start to have probably a bit of an impact on the waiting list as well is the um the mutual support as well if you remember we did some mutual support to choose in relationship to friends there he's asking with Ali. we're also asking for mutual support in relationship to children and young people so i think it's the whole picture not just the waiting list but you know we've got some real partnership approaches to to it as well and obviously lynn's ha actively involved in that thanks michelle that's really encouraging and useful because i mean it's vital that you know these children do get the help they need i mean because you're right lynn i mean there's some there is some really good things in here i mean adult asd is coming down but you know it's not just that you're right the child asd levels are up at really high levels now the waiting list and so I'm really encouraged by what you said about the new initiatives and the new learning. Um, just in terms of core CAMs, because obviously excluding ASD, that's gone up again as well. So presumably that was covered by this external work as well. It was very much Sharon, but I think that's a slightly different picture. I'm confident we can make changes for the reasons that I've said and Michelle's added to. But there is a real surge in demand for core CAMs. And, and as Michelle has said, that's not just true of us, but that's a national picture as well. We certainly have seen that um, national picture um, in our um, eating disorder referrals from East Riding, particularly now, as Michelle said, you know, that there's lots of sort of work that we are doing and with partners. So, for, in, for example, we have had some additional funding. It's with Precious funding, it's from Recurrence to um, establish a home treatment service. So that's great news and that will really help us sort of offset some of the pressures around here for beds um, currently. Um, I think quite frankly we need to do something in addition to what we're already commissioned to provide in terms of eating disorders and we are looking at that very actively at the moment. So, um, so I think there are slightly different factors Sharon but undoubtedly you know with those other interventions that we've just talked about the whole aim of all of that obviously is to reduce waiting times but there is a real surge in in cams as we anticipated um but you know i think we we systemically have have got plans in place but we need to put those into into action thanks lynn very helpful mike smith thanks very much lynn um i'd like to draw a connection between the cpa 72 hour follow-up and and the work that we're doing here on the waiting list so we were measuring previously seven day follow-ups for cpa along came the national confidential inquiry and we said well the, the key trigger is at the three-day mark um, and we changed the way we looked at things so drawing that connection I'm really interested in impact of waiting lists and how we're going to handle on, for example, the children and the dual whammy of not being at school and not having the support there. And what impact measures we use in terms of waiting lists to see what our patient experience is like and whether we ever get a coroner's report that says, well, if they'd have not waited as long, this wouldn't have happened sort of thing. I know there's no silver bullet, Lynn, but I just wondered how we can seek assurance on that. Yeah, I think that's a really good one, Mike. And I think we have talked about this um, here before. And certainly I know it's been of um, quite rightly interest of the Quality Committee too. So um, autism, as you know, the clock starts at referral and stops at diagnosis. But quite often there's actually a lot of clinical contact between those two points. And in actual fact, that's one of the things that we're working with the commissioners and system partners on. Actually, a lot of those children and young people and their families have had a lot of contact through that period. Some of that contact is by us. But actually, some of the other system partners could actually um, take responsibility for some of that contact as well and they're, they're you know well placed to do that leaving us i guess to concentrate all of our expertise or more of our expertise on actually reaching that diagnosis so i think that's one example mike where you know we can work sort of, sort of differently and that is in our planning at the moment i mean seven day follow-up as you say and it's impact on safety and quality i think you know that that contact irrespective that somebody's on our waiting list actually what is the contact who else is in contact with that service user as well and obviously if their needs do escalate in that period that we you know the, there's direct access into service for that need to be met at that point in time and our waiting times policy certainly sets that out really clearly that that is our expectation so i can assure you that there are sort of safety measures <laughs> built into those processes but overall obviously we're working to eradicate 
um, waiting times where we can. As you know, the community mental health team, transformation work, um, one of the key performance indicators around that is reaching a, a wait of no longer than four weeks. And actually, we're really close to that now already across our services. So that's a great place to be. So, you know, but but we have got these pockets, as the data tells us, particularly around children and young people. But with all the work that I've just talked about, and Michelle's endorsed too, you know, we, it takes some time, I think, to get there, but we are working hard. Lynn, um, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. And, and the point about contact is really useful because that's sitting there behind the scenes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. And uh, Peter? Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Lynn, for all that on, on, on the waiting list. One of, one of my questions was going to be about ASD. So we, I mean, you've given a really thorough reply. Um, so that's a lot of assurance there. And, and it'd be good, you know, maybe in a couple of meetings time to see those uh, those figures going the, the right way. Um, so my other question was this going to be on the on the dashboard around Town End Court, um, because you know, it's only about half bullish, but um, the clinical supervision is down at 48 percent and all, and also the um, mandatory training is at 50 percent um, and mandatory training generally is, is gone very well for the trust especially I think there's been, a lot of staff have been doing it online uh, it's easy easy to do it online etc so I'm, I'm not quite sure why yeah there's that problem at, at town end and, and given their given their occupancy rates and, and their clinical hours per patient per day um, good figures there if you like why clinical supervision would, would be so low i just i just wonder if you could fill us in any, any background and how those figures uh, might be improved upon in, in, in the coming months lynn you're okay to answer that you're on mute lynn so do you want to let hillary come in first chair on yeah, supervision and then yeah. i'll pick up any other issues Hilary? Yes, if I could just pick up the supervision for all of the units that are flagging red and amber, they've all got increased this, this month. So um, Town and Court is 82% is the, the latest figures for that. So but that's January. So they're, they're more or less actually the same, aren't they? Sorry. That's changed since the one that I was looking at. But Millview Lodge, that's 100% now. So they've all gone up. New Bridges as well that was flagging, which is of concern at 47. That's 79%. I do know with Town End Court, they've got some very acutely unwell patients, which will be um, affecting them, them with the staffing. But Lynn might want to, to mention more about that. Yes, and so whilst the occupancy is low, the acuity of the service users that Town and Court have been working with since just before Christmas actually is extremely high. So in fact, they've got service users who are delayed transfers of care and um, waiting for um, beds, um, one of them actually in a secure setting. So um, the intensity of the staffing that's needed to manage the um, the complexity is very high at Town End Court at the moment. So we are supporting them. In fact, our secure services are supporting them um, at the moment. So, and obviously in terms of the delayed transfers, certainly I'm escalating those to the appropriate um, places, particularly specialised commissioners where that's the case at the minute. So I think that that level of um, acuity is impacting uh, at least to some degree on the training statistics at the moment, although I will take that way and have a good look um, at it um, as well, because we need to keep that um, in a good place so overall. So um, it's a good point. We'll take that back. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, is that all right, Peter? I'll move on to Francis then, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, most of my questions have been answered by the thorough briefing and the and the good notes. So a couple of comments and one question. Uh, the comment, two comments. First one was on proportion of post vacant. Just congratulations on the continuing good work, both overall and on nursing establishment. It seems to be improving month on month, which is a really good steady improvement. And then my comment and questions were on RTT because uh, RTT um, for the um, completed pathways looking really good, seven months of improvement and now above target, which is excellent. Um, but the incomplete pathway, whilst it continues to improve, obviously is still a long way behind target. So, and I know there's some issues there. I just wonder what, what the thoughts are on that, Lynn, in terms of that. It's going the right way, but obviously still a long way to go. Yeah, I think as I've perhaps said uh, 
hopefully Francis and some of the other responses, you know, we did see a suppressed demand and then we did see some rise in referrals um, for some of our services. Um, and obviously, because of the impact of the second surge in October and November, where some staff were redirected away from community services to support our core services, particularly in patients. So I think collectively, all of that had impact on some of those areas of waiting times that we've already talked about. We really wanted to use and maximise the benefit of the external consultants. They've all focused in those areas where waiting times have been um, an issue. The um, findings, to some degree, they tell us what we already knew, but there's a level of data detail that's been really helpful to that. And I think that piece of work as well wasn't just about sort of waiting times. It was really about upskilling the operational managers in really getting that understanding of capacity and demand analysis and what that means for their services. So and I think that legacy has been left now um, through the work that Attain has has done. So operationally, I feel that service managers, general managers are in a different position now in how they're looking at these areas, particularly where waiting times are an issue. So I think there are some green shoots there, Francis, that are, is suggesting that you know some of the data is going in the right direction. I have certainly requested um, that the managers, you know, really focus on this, that they increase the pace on this work. And I also think the point of taking clinicians with us through this process as well is a really important one. So there is obviously opportunity through now the digitally enhanced pathways. You know, some of those are much more productive or efficient. So, you know, but moving to those, you know, we've been doing that through the pandemic, but, you know, it's been necessary to think and, you know, work with the clinicians, particularly around, you know, making sure that the evidence base for these pathways is as good and indeed in some cases it's better. So with all of that work, and as I say, the Deputy Chief Operating Officer is focused explicitly, it's her sort of um, highest priority to continue to support the divisions through this. So. Um, I do think it's the work is there. I think the understanding is there. I think the data analysis now is where I want it to be. So my expectation is, um, hopefully without further surges of, of COVID, that we really should see this data now moving in, in, in the right direction. We've got improvement trajectories in place for all of those areas with over 18 week waiting times. Those are monitored now on a weekly basis. In fact, we're monitoring um, those areas with over 18 weeks on a patient by patient basis. That's what the coup does now. And she actually, a deputy coup, now she's actually setting sort of targets week on week for where we expect to see that improvement taking place. So I think the grip on this, Francis, is, is as good as it can be. So as I say, my expectation is we will see improvement. Okay. Okay, thanks, Francis. Uh, Steve? Thanks, Sharon, and uh, Francis, thanks for the for the comments around um, the vacancies. Um, I think it, I'd, I'd just like to sort of commend Hillary's team, if I may, um, Chair, because uh, I think there's been some fantastic leadership and real shift on the nurse numbers, as Francis um, as Francis mentioned. And also, it's worth noting we've now got a plan to bring uh, 20 international nurses in next year. We know where they're going in the organisation. We're working collaboratively across the system to do that. So I think that will further strengthen the position. So it it, it really feels like there's, um, there's there's excellent leadership in there, and it's starting to pay dividends. Thanks, Dave. And yes, please do commend your team, Hilary. Just on that, because um, I haven't got any other hands up, can I just ask a, a question? Um, it was great to see the nursing vacancies coming down and the trajectory on those things, but just on the dashboard, which is on page um, 58, there's, um, and forgive me if this is a, a, a silly question, but there's a registered nurse vacancy rates um, uh, table at the bottom of that, and that shows the rates going up, not down, is it what are we measuring in that so i'm clear because that shows on the face of it looks different to the one on page 55. so this the, the one on page 55 tells me the rates are going down so the vacancy there's not so many vacancies this one appears on the face of it to tell me the rates are going up and they're both different figures do you want me to answer that one sharon please yeah yeah i'm i'm guessing but i will confirm just for my own assurance that the inpatient the rate on the dashboard is just for inpatient services 
and the rate you're seeing on the wider IBR is trust level vacancies. But I will confirm just for my own sanity, if nothing else. It is, yeah. The, the dashboard relates to the inpatients. Right, okay. So that's, that's my what understanding as well. But but sorry to interrupt. That is my understanding as well. But if we can clarify that in a board minute, I think that would just be really helpful, yeah. Pete. I'll I'll double check, Michelle, just, just for completeness. No, that's sorry, fine. Then. That that's helpful and, and we can always just alter the thing but you can see my point can't you well one thing was telling me it's going down and the other one's telling me it's going up so um that's fine just on that dashboard as well and hillary i'm sure you'll have looked into this we've got some quite very high sickness record um levels haven't we so for example we've got uh, new bridges at 17 percent for example so um what's going on there i'm presuming that's not covid particularly driven now so well, there's still elements, yeah, very much impacted still by COVID with um, having to isolate. Okay. Um, uh, obviously, keeping an eye on it. Um, figures out too bad now that they are coming back down. But set, this is December, remember. This is across the Christmas period when, obviously, um, it, the prevalence was raising again in, in the community. So it will be reflected in those figures. Okay, that's fine. Because, yeah, because there's some quite, yeah, as I say, yeah, and PQ obviously was up high there as well. So we've already discussed They've that. They've been particularly impacted by COVID. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. I'll just check if there's anything else. And I think that's it. So thank you very much. I think we've, oh, Peter. So I, you, you've just reminded me there, Sharon, that just talk, when you were talking about the dashboard and you were talking about the, um, the registered nurse va vacancies, the, the figures are actually two different months because the dashboard is December. And, and the other figures are January, so they'll, they'll never be exactly the same. But I, I just wondered if it's worth, um, you know, reconsidering whether the dash, dashboard could be perhaps the January, you know, the, the, the next month rather than, you know, always such a bit of a lag. I wonder if that perhaps the executive could, could consider that because Hillary has been mentioning some figures on a new set of numbers which she, which she's got, which which is great. But you know, is it possible to review whether we can have, uh, you know, newer figures on the on the dashboard? What's my request? Can I just respond to that? We'll certainly look at it again, Peter. Um, I do know it's always been an issue because when the figures are all pulled together, they're then sent out to the matrons and the teams to look at and validate, provide any commentary, etc. And so that does put a bit of a lag in it, which is what's always created the the uh, delay that we've had. The figures I quoted are some figures that I've basically got this week, really, which is after the board papers have gone out. So that, that's as current as that is. But I, I'm sure that, um, I'm, Pete, I don't know if you want to say anything about whether or not we could um, have another look and see whether or not we could uh, make it a bit more, um, you know, the, the, the information that we've got is more timely, really, in, in the report, because it is, it's the only slide, isn't it, that's looking back at December, all the others are January. I think we can certainly look at it, can't we? I can't make any promises, because I think you made a good point about the validation piece we do yeah. give them some of the scrutiny we need on this, Hillary. Okay, Michelle. Yeah, let, 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 let's have a look at it, because it is really important. It might be that we just have to have a bit of a health warning and, and almost some unvalidated figures, but we can have a look at it and just see what, what best we can do. So let, leave it with us, we'll take it away and we'll feed it back in. Thanks, that's really helpful. We'll take that as an action then, Jenny, for the exec to have a look at that then, please. Thank you. Um, so we, I think we can move on now. Thank you. Good debate. Um, to item 10 of the finance report, Pete. So thank you, Chair. So this is the month 10 finance position. I'll put out some key highlights, then be happy to take any questions on the report. So at month 10, we're continuing to report a break-even position for the trust, which is consistent with our phase three plan. And that's after the allowable exceptions, which are mainly donated asset depreciation and asset impairment. You'll note from the report, our COVID expenditure year to date is 12.1 million. What I can provide assurance is that our run rate for months seven to 10 is within the level of funding identified. You know, within the report, you'll see year to date capital is just above 5 million. Given the recent success we've had in capital bids, well, we'd expect that to accelerate significantly in the next two months. Um, we kind of covered cash in the performance report. So, you know, if I was to summarize, Chair, I think we remain in a strong and stable financial position. We fully expect to meet our phase three financial planning targets and I'm happy to take any questions on the content of the report. Thanks very much, Pete. Uh, Mike Smith. Thanks, Pete. Can I just take you to page 85, um, paragraph 24, please? Um, so the corporate services expenditure 1.162 overspent. Um, once the um, line on, once something is excluded, 
it comes down to 0 0.29029. So is finance technical, a technical adjustment, or is it actually a budget head that's overspent? It's it's a combination of two things that are in there, Mike. One is the BRS profiling for the major schemes to keep us at a break-even position throughout the year. So at the moment, that's slightly behind. And secondly, where we've got COVID central expenditure sits within that line. Thanks, thanks Peter. I'm just, just querying the terminology because for a public meeting, to put it sits within finance technical, it's so easy to come to the conclusion that there's some department there that's a million overspent. So that, that might be better rephrased, pressure sits within technical adjustments or however you, you want to phrase it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's a good point. Thank you. Thanks for that, Mike. Anything else on the finance report before we move on? Uh, we've obviously got the assurance report coming up um, next. No, thank you. So if we can move into the assurance committee reports and um, Mike's going to give us a verbal update on quality, but we'll start with the ones on the agenda. So we'll start with finance committee assurance report, Francis. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, we had a really good uh, meeting last week uh, and, and you've already picked up on some of the stuff that's in here from previous reports. So um, in, in Pete's report, we've picked up on planning guidance and a number of the other issues in the uh, Insight report. Uh, we've also picked up on cash um, and, and where we are from a cash position. The things that uh, I probably would pull out is on the BRS. We had a really good discussion about that. And at the next meeting, um, the team are going to bring a detailed analysis for both major and divisional schemes that haven't delivered this year so we can see what flows into next year. Uh, the other point I would pull out in terms of the planning advice, uh, the team did a really good paper for us to give us some assurance as to where we were uh, and talked about where we were going next year and, and, and laid out a plan for that, which was really helpful. Um, within that, there are some BRS schemes which obviously would need to go to quality committee for QIA just to make sure that the QIA side of that is done well. Uh, and then that's probably the only key things I'd pull out. The rest is there for information. Happy to take any questions or is there anything, Pete, that you want to add? Uh, the only bits I'd possibly add to that, Francis, good summary was, you know, note the improved ICS position. So from previous Finance Committee assurance reports, the ICS was behind plan. It's now reporting an improved position. And that's mainly in the acute sector and central COVID funding held back by the CCGs. I guess it's I find it interesting to see the national position where at month eight it was 9.7 billion above the mandate. And I think we've talked before in, in board about the run rate on COVID nationally be, being about 1.2 billion a month. And that does exclude PPE, test and trace and other things that have been funded centrally. And I think we've covered elsewhere on the, the agenda bits about planning guidance coming late March and just the key dates for the accounts. You know, so they'll be coming to the trust board on the 30th of June. Then I'll stop there, but I thought it was a really good meeting. Thanks very much, Peyton. Thank you for getting the assurance report out as well. Any questions on that? No, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we can move on then to item 12, which is the Mental Health Legislation Committee Assurance Report. Mike Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just on the cover sheet, I'd just like to highlight that um, the committee received two presentations. These weren't just factual presentations. These were actually deep dives that I'll come to later. Um, when it says the steering group is working effectively um, for public consumption underneath the Mental Health Legislation Committee, it's a mental health steering group which considers the operational aspects. Um, Kwame um, Fiofe and Michelle Nolan have worked really hard to get a grip on that and I wanted to thank them. Um, task and finish groups for the Mental Health Act white paper. Um, this is about how do you eat an elephant and that's in bite-sized chunks. Um, it, it's an enormous piece of work to do and it was very pleasing to hear that there was a methodology to reviewing that. Um, and the Equality and Diversity Annual Report I'll come to later because I think that has a wider impact than just within Mental Health Ledge. Um, so if I start with that one, uh, receiving the Equality and Diversity Annual Report, you'll note that we received it and we're assured that our detentions and so on are in line with the general population. Um, but there's some more work to be done there. Uh, and when I say more work to be done, this isn't mental health legislation saying what about this or what about that. This is about the team that's responsible for this actually saying we need to look at this more. So it's a very proactive approach about the under 16 population and the Eastern European population. And I just wondered, Steve, whether 
this might be some of the evidence for EDS2, which we come to later in the report about what we're doing in this area. In terms of the uh, seclusion medical reviews, um, really, really important um, that we review seclusion. And again, they've got a methodology, uh, they've got a template that's going to be used for the nursing staff um, for seclusion nursing reviews. So it's not only just receiving assurance uh, mental health ledge about, well, everything seems to be okay benchmarking terms. It's about this proactivity and the improvements in operational level. Same with section 136. Um, and about some issues that we need to discuss with the crisis care con court at and Humberside Police. And the Trust and Humberside Police have both stretched in terms of resource. So it was really good to hear that that work is passing through under the leadership of Michelle, our Chief Executive, to actually work with the police on these issues. And um, so I think that's about it. Uh, any questions? Uh, John, thank you, Mike, for that. Very comprehensive. John, anything you want to add? Um, thanks, Chair. No, um, I'd just like to thank Mike, actually, because I, I think Mike has um, been really helpful in getting us to talk around some of the big issues and look out a little bit more. And we've only been able to do that, as he says, because that we now have confidence in the steering group um, that that sort of look sort of sort of churning through the work below with all the sort of a multidisciplinary clinical involvement, which has allowed us to perhaps look at some of the, the other wider issues, which has been really helpful. Thanks, John. Michelle? Yeah, I mean, I'd echo that and everybody, everybody's work on the Mental Health uh, Legislation Committee. And, and it's great to see it moving from that operational bit into that assurance committee. So, so thank you for that, because it is really quite difficult. Obviously, the white paper is important, but, but Mike's touched on that. One of the things for me here, I think, that we need to see probably next time or sometime soon is a bit more detail and data, Mike, on, and I know that it, it's in the system, and I think from a board perspective, on the diversity and detentions. It's something both with my CEO at on and also with my ICS at on, I'm really interested in, in relationship to the actual, and, and getting into some of the, a bit of the granular detail really, like how many, um, uh, in what ethnic groups and in what age groups from a detention and the section two, threes, et cetera. And how does that compare with um, a demographic similar to us nationally. So I think for me, and I know that conversation has gone on at Mental Health Ledge, I would really like to see something here at board um, relatively soon that sets out that, because I think it will link into some of our diversity work, might link into some of the work that Hillary is doing on, on violence and aggression, et cetera, and certainly link into some of the work that, that some of the networks are doing. So if I could maybe just ask, ask for that to come back through the chair, I think that would be really I helpful. Think that's really, really helpful, Michelle, because from memory, the report that came through to Mental Health Ledge, there's nothing that shouldn't be in the public domain in that. And it was a really, really good report. And to say, as I have done, that we want to take that a stage further is something that the public should know about and should be input into the wider ICS system and that, that, that you're heavily involved with and leading on. Uh, yeah, I think that's good. Matt. Sorry, again, through the chair. Again, it's, I don't think it's from the public. And it's also the assurance here that, that, that our detentions are in, in line roughly with some of the national work and what we're doing in relationship to, you know, re removing the need for detentions, etc. So I think it, it is both for the public domain, actually, Matt, but also for the, the board as well. But, but yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. John, is there anything you want to say in response to that? Um, no, we, we, we will have shared the papers um, with the members. So I, I think there might be something, you know, I think there is something from a, a publicity and a conversation view that we can think about how do we share this information more widely? Because um, it is interesting information. Um, and when we think about the Mental Health Act, um, the sort of revised papers that are coming down the tracks, there is a huge focus um, particularly on the diversity element, particularly the, the racial inequalities. Um, but actually, when we think about our own local context, as Mike, as sort of Mike's paper sort of talks about, is the Eastern European component, which we would have in Hull, which would be different perhaps to what you might have in somewhere like central London or central Birmingham. So we all have a diversity context, but actually our diversity context may not be quite with regard to um, the BAME population, but a slightly different population which is something for us to think about, which I think is articulated um, in, in, in Mike's notes. But absolutely, there's more to do in this. OK, well, thank you. I think that's a good suggestion, Michelle. So we'll take that as an action. Um, and I think Michelle said sooner rather than later, but I'll leave John and Mike you to work out the timing layers with Jenny, if you would. 
um, as to when that comes back to the board um, in the context of those comments. So thank you. Uh, Dean. Yeah, it's a similar theme, uh, uh, Michelle, and uh, Mike has uh, highlighted it. So I, I was just going to emphasise really that when Mike was saying about more to be done, um, it is it is reflected in the paper there, but it was very much in the context of how much has been achieved uh, over the last few years in terms of equality and, and diversity and the, uh, uh, the praise and encouragement we gave colleagues that presented at the Mental Health Legislation uh, committee. Uh, inevitably, when you're on that uh, continuous improvement journey, you, you do a piece of work to find something out and it opens up more questions that you want to dig deeper into. And that was exactly the uh, the case that we'd, uh, we'd got here. But just sort of emphasising, uh, I suppose, as, as well about, uh, as, um, as, as John was saying, you know, an increasing focus, I think, on equality and diversity, the way that COVID has highlighted some health uh, inequalities, uh, but also the way that, uh, I mean, we've got the EDS2 on the board paper later today, uh, we have picked up equality and diversity issues in the uh, quality meetings that Mike uh, Cook chair, sort of looking at the impact on patients. And we clearly also pick that up in the workforce committee, looking at uh, implications from staff and have had uh, staff networks that now join our uh, workforce committee. So I think that there is a, an increasing sort of profile across the organisation on this and a, and a sort of joined upness about looking at uh, you know the implications for staff, the implications for uh, quality, the implications for uh, uh, for outcomes. Uh, so, so good to see across the whole organisation. I think. Thanks, Dean. Um, and I attended that meeting. It was a good meeting. And I, th I, uh, I have to say that the papers and the presentations have moved on enormously. And uh, the presentations were really good um, presentations from the two doctors. So um, thank you very much. OK, thanks for that. Um, so if we move on, please, to item 13, the Audit Committee Assurance Report. Peter. OK, thanks very much, uh, Sharon. So the, the reports that I won't, I won't go through every, everything um, because I'm, I'm hoping it's, it's been read by um, board members, but just to pick up on one or two things then. Um, as regards the internal audit, um, it was a second meeting that Audit Yorkshire have um, attended. They've been with us since the 1st of October, you'll probably remember, and I think you know, they've, they've settled in really well and they're contributing um, nicely to discussions and, and very positively. I think it is fair to say that they are a little bit behind on their 2021 audit work and we have extended the deadline to 30th of April um, because there's only one audit report here which is the Mental Health Act and that was significant assurance so uh, you know that, that was a, a very good report but um, you know we have extended the deadline by a month and they will be in a position um, by the next meeting to have, to have signed off on, on their year-end um, uh, assurance reports for the board. Um, on internal audit still the 1920 recommendations, um, excellent um, progress on those, and, they, and they're, they're all on track. The, the current year's recommendations, 2021, that have, that have come in you know, since, since the 1st of April, I think um, nine of those um, had been deferred, which is more than we were expecting. Um, so I think we've probably been pushed back to sort of the executive to make sure that EMT sign off on every, everything that uh, is, is deferred so that you know we're, we're perhaps pushing back a little bit on some of these deferments of the action um, points being be, being um, being delayed so that's that's just something which I think will be addressed for the future a um, little bit disappointed that the 21-22 internal audit plan um, hasn't come out yet as last year uh, COVID may be part of it but um, we have been promised a, a draft to the to the audit committee members by the 31st of March. So we're, we're hoping to um, approve a draft at least uh, virtually uh, in time for for the for the new year starting. Moving on to the external auditors, Mazars, um, you'd be aware that there's been a delay in the um, requirement for the, for this year's audit. The delay is to the 15th of June because of COVID. So the audit committee has been deferred to the 22nd of, of June. To, um, to, to sort of coincide with that. There's no requirement this year for, for an audit of the quality indicators, so there's a little bit less for them to do there. Um, other points, really good buy-in on, on the risk register and, and the BAF. Um, we had good representation and discussion from um, two representatives from uh, you know, the mental health division, uh, good discussion there and, and um, it's good to see that you know the, the, the buy-in to the to the risk register from from the divisions and and um, really taking this seriously. It's a really living a living document. 
um, procurement. It was it was good to see that they've adapted very very well to the the digital world that, that, that they've been in sort of since since March last year. They've they've developed new um, ways of signing things off, which have been at low cost to the trust. Um, so that we, we we did get really good assurance that uh, that that department was was working effectively um, even in the world that that we live in. I don't think there was any. Oh, the only th other thing I perhaps mention is the increase in in the um, clinical negligence insurance for next year. Um, we have seen increases in the past year or two, but um, next year's rate is is going up again by about 140,000. So it's just really for noting for the board. Um, got that cost pressure on next, on next year's budget. Apart from that, it's, uh, I'll revert to questions. OK, thank you, Peter. Pete, is there anything you want to add before we take questions? Well, I think that was a really good summary by Peter. I mean, I think I'd echo it's good to see Audit Yorkshire bedding down. We know they're a tiny bit behind on the audit programme, but we have got the assurance, and I met with them earlier this week, that we'll get sufficient audit coverage to get ahead of internal audit opinion, which is obviously the critical thing. And I know there are a meeting with all the execs at the moment in terms of finalising or suggesting the final plan for 21-22, which will be roughly based on the strategic plan when they tendered, and that will go to EMT in March, Chair. Thanks, Pete. Well, we've got quite a few hands up for this one, so I'll start with John, please. So just to say, in, in terms of the internal audit um, piece, that um, I've been consulted by them uh, by Tom this year. That's been a really helpful opportunity for me as an exec in terms of bringing that quality focus onto the internal audit plan and just thinking some about the historical stuff that we've done and how we're going to change that to think about um, what would be useful for the organisation in terms of quality and quality governance as well. So actually spending that little bit of time just thinking um, thinking through that and working with me as an exec um, has been really helpful. So hopefully when the plan does get there, it'll feel that it'll just might tick some more boxes than may have historically have been the case. Thank you. Thanks, John. Very helpful. Dean? A, a sim similar sort of uh, issue really just about the internal audit plan and just checking what the process might be for engaging uh, some of the other committees uh, for example um, you know there's, there's always a balance isn't the on sort of audit plans between getting further reassurance of things that might have happened in the past and then sort of focusing them on those areas where we want to uh, uh, sort of make progress and uh, I'm sure that the execs will give a good view of that but there may well be things that come out um, through a sort of workforce or quality committee that uh, sort of could contribute uh, to the um, to the development of the plan. Yeah thanks thanks just on, on that Dean I would normally have, have attached the draft plan to, to this assurance report so that we could have had that discussion at that board if, if we needed to um, but we'll certainly um, take your comments on board make sure that you see the draft uh, and if you need to run it, run it, run it through the committee, or at least through the committee members virtually. Yeah, we'll take that as an action. Um, I think you did that last year, actually, Peter. Anyway, but um, I think it's a good suggestion, Dean. So thank you for that, uh, Steve. Yeah, sort of first segue segues in nicely, really, Dean. Um, so I met with Tom yesterday. Um, we talked through it. It's um, we've got that agenda for workforce committee in March, Dean. So we were going to bring back what I discussed with Tom as a kind of provisional plan to talk it through. Because um, as um, as we've discussed before, I think it's a really good check for us to say from an assurance point of view, is this covering the things that we kind of picked up in that committee over the previous 12 months? So hopefully, hopefully the stars align and that works, but certainly from a process point of view, it's on our agenda for the March meeting, Dean. That's great. And it would be helpful to probably have a consistent approach across the committees. So um, Michelle Hughes, can um, we don't need to take this, I don't think it's board action, but can you just um, pick that up with the chairs and the exec leads for each committee? Yes, Chair. Thank you very much for that. I think that's a good suggestion. Thank you. If we can move on then, please, to item 14, the Commissioning Committee Assurance Report, and we are going to be asked to approve the terms of reference. So, Peter. OK, thanks. Thanks, Sharon. I'm, I'm sorry that the paper didn't make it clear that we're, the terms of reference for, for approval, but uh, but they are. We, the board has not seen these before. Um, but yeah, we, we are. We, I think we've had two meetings now. Um, what I would say from the assurance point of view is the work plan has been built up by, by the team in terms of 0 to 6 months, uh, 6 to 12 months and beyond are, re are really developing well. Um, so I, I think from that point of view, we are well assured 
Um, I, I guess the, con the concern possibly is, is more in terms of the due diligence. Um, we have in, at the last meeting commenced um, the quality due diligence, and I think on Friday when we have the next meeting, we've got a report on quality due diligence just to, just to run through that and where we are. Uh, and I, from a glance at the papers, I think that is well progressed. Um, financial due diligence, I don't think there's been any progression since um, we, we talked about a six to seven million pound um, issue there. Um, and I don't believe that, that, that there's been an, you know, an awful lot of progress from NHSIE on, on that. So that is a, is a concern. Um, it's something which, you know, as, as we speak today, we, we would have to um, do an, an awful lot more work with in, in terms of making sure that that gap is, is, uh, is, is filled before we can, we can press forward with this. Unless there's been a, an update in the last couple of days, Pete, but uh, I think, you know, so I'd say the financial due diligence is, is the biggest for me, the, big, the biggest concern um, going forward. I know we've got another board session, I think, in March to look at this. Um, the other area that I think we would need, would, we need to have a look at still is, is the partnership agreement. Um, I've checked with Mel this morning, and um, although Hill Dickinson are, are, are drafting this, we still haven't seen, or well, the committee still haven't been tabled a, a, a draft to have a look at. So there's quite a lot of work just to make sure that uh, we're happy with, with that when it when it comes round. And there's not an awful lot of time now. There's only five weeks to go before we want to go live. So uh, I think we're, you know, we're going to have to possibly um, put some more meeting time in in between meetings to, to make sure that these things get uh, pro properly um, discussed and we get the assurance that we need that they're going to work properly. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there. I'll let uh, Perhaps the, the executives come in. OK, Michelle, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in there? Yeah, first of all, can we obviously just declare the um, the interest, Michelle? I've just checked the declarations of interest. So can we just obviously formally note that, Jenny, before this this item? And we've got we've got some standard uh, some standard uh, sentences, as we, we mentioned. Just to say, yes, I know the financial um, is, is still, and we know we've got a commission committee on Friday um, that we can pick that up again then. And then, obviously, we've got the board session um, to update the board in more detail. I mean, just to say that from a national perspective, it was really clear yesterday that they really do expect everybody to go live from the 1st of April um, because just because of the ICS development. So I do think that we do need to think about how we do that and how we work through that and, and how we work with the um, the regional office particularly um, with that. Um, we've also started to look to utilise the provider collaborative in relationship to um, other bids that are coming through from a transformation point of view, which I think will be really useful. So it's a really exciting and we've got to remember this is about patients this is about you know improving um, improving care for patients and reducing some of those silos that currently exist so so i do think it's important that that we um press on but we do need to clear that that circle square that circle in relationship to finance we maybe can pick up a bit more later but we'll certainly pick it up at the board time now thanks michelle um dean yeah, it's, it's just picking up, Peter, I guess, the uh, the sort of tricky issue of conflicts of interests. And um, I guess given the, the scope and the roles and responsibilities on people in there where their organisations are affected by decisions that the committee will will make, I, I don't know if any thought has been given to, you know, when is it appropriate for people to declare an interest? And when is it appropriate for people to recuse themselves from the decision making process? Um, you know, that's as much an issue, I think, for us as an organisation, as other people uh, involved. And it, and, and it may be something that has to be, as it were, tested in anger to sort of plot a way through that, because this is a sort of new thing to do. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of very conscious that, that sometimes just declaring is it enough, is it? Um, yeah. You know, we, we might expect people to recuse themselves from a particular uh, sorts of decision. Um, but, you know, getting the, the, the balance and governance of, of, of that is tricky. I agree. I think yeah, at the moment it's business as usual for, for the for these work streams and, and, and these contracts. But I think over time, I think we do need to think about that, Dean. Um, you know, as we're perhaps six months into it, something like that. Okay, Michelle. 
Yeah, we've done a, it's a really good question, Dean, and it's, we've done a lot of work on it. And obviously, Michelle with us, and Michelle's actually on the committee on, partly for that reason, just to make sure that from a corporate point of view, we did try to have a look at how uh, the governance from a PCT point of view, because it's very similar. And I remember when I worked at Barnes, and we did all the spec on budget then, all those years ago. So, but I think you're right, it's how do we do that? And I think some of it will be tested in anger. But we are really, I think the, the most important thing for the board is that we're really cautious of that, both from an individual organisation point of view for ourselves, because obviously we're commissioning some things from ourselves, but also, also in relationship to our partners. We're trying to work some of that through in the partnership agreement and the risk share. We've also got quite a, a, quite a mix of providers as well, because we've got independent sector, we've got CAKES, we've got NHS statutory services so we've also got a few different um different providers as well so i think some of that will be let's test it out and see what happens we're also linking into other areas as well see how that and we are probably a bit ahead of the curve really we're utilizing hill dickinson as well to help us so i, I think you know the most important thing is i think we're aware of it and and yes we may make the odd little um little um issue but i think we'll we'll, we'll be aware of when that happens the other reason is the ned position obviously peter's there from an independent point of view with being said and being on the audit committee but also when we recruit the associate non-exec director that, that'll be their main that'll be the only committee as well so that'll give us a bit more of a clear blue water between certainly our organization and others but i think you are other organizations will need to be tested as well but i noticed michelle's got a hand up and michelle's done a lot of work on this both within our constitution as well as with with externals as you would imagine it's a good so, point Dean. there's no real answer to it we're just working through it Michelle, yeah. really good point. A declaration is just that, a declaration. Um, we're really cognizant of that in the meeting, and I know Peter as chair is, is very on to that as we go through the meeting. You'll note at the moment the only members on the committee are um, uh, Humber, members of our trust. Anybody else at the moment is coming as an attendee for their agenda item. So this is something very much in in development that is being really clearly worked out as we go through these early meetings but i think we're, we're kind of we have a protection in that the members of humber and the other parties that come to provide assurance are for their particular items only but you'll see more in the terms of reference about that makeup thank you okay thank you um just a couple of things from me so just in terms of process then um the time scale did have the um the partnership agreement coming to the board in february obviously given what michelle said about the first of april when does that need to come that's come to march sharon okay yeah, so we'll that. have that on the agenda for march then jenny um and obviously it'll go through that committee first presumably before yeah. then so that's fine and just on the terms of reference, um, uh, well, well, and also Michelle Hughes, it was just a comment, just to, um, I'm sure you have, but just to check the SFIs and SIs in relation to this committee, if there's any changes that need to be made. If so, they'll need to come back, obviously. Um, and um, just on the terms of reference, and I know it's work in progress, and absolutely I accept that, but it's the only for sort of board subcommittee. And I do realise it's a sort of unique board subcommittee, which doesn't have to have a non-exec there to be corporate, um, because it's chair or vice chair. So I just I'm flagging that up now that I think in time that's something we just need to consider um as we as we move forward and as we sort of develop into this. I think the Michelle. idea is that when we get the um, associate non-exec, they'll be vice chair, so there will be a non-exec. All right, you, we, what, you, we are, cause it's a very small committee, so yeah. we are conscious of that, Sharon. So, um, yeah, and, and one of the things we had a long conversation about was the, was the quality of it. No, that's fine, but I'm just saying that from my point of view, I'm just flagging it up that as going forward, I think we just need to consider that as it is a board subcommittee. That's fine. So are we happy to um, approve the terms of reference as they are on the basis that we re do realise that they will develop and they will um, change as we progress with this? Everybody happy to do that? Any dissensions? Sharon, oh. Sharon I, I just wonder if we ought to say that they're approved subject to the financial due diligence, just so we're clear that there's still another decision making process before we proceed on the 1st of April. Is that my understanding correct? I think that's right, Dean. I think what we're asking for is approval for the commissioning committee to terms of reference, but obviously go live with the provider club will be subject to board approval in March. 
Yeah, I think it's, I think it's like I think it's a good point, Eva. I think they're slightly different things. I think things. Yeah, that we, we're separating out the terms of reference, which will change anyway. And if we didn't go ahead, well, they'd just fall away, wouldn't they? So yeah. I think that. Yeah. But it's a good point. The, the yeah. two different things. So yeah. So I think. Yeah. Yeah. No. It was just that right. point, Sharon. It's just being clear that we. Uh, you know that they're, they're, they're they're approved uh, but we still got to make the decision on the other stuff i just didn't wanted to yeah. get lost yeah. in that process but that's, no, that's, uh, that's yeah. a good point. i think and if we sorry i think if we can minute that that the committee is approved but not the fact that they go live date i think we've got to do with there's, there's quite a lot of water to go under the bridge and obviously the most important thing is that big board time out session where we can get into the real granular detail of it as well so and that'll be before the march meeting when we make the decision so but i think you're right dean it, it's just for the committee um which we can approve and then but it's completely separate to the go live uh, process and thank you and jenny will, yeah no that's that's helpful and uh, um jenny will also take an action that i'm sure she will have already done it but michelle hughes will just review the sfi the sis and the sfis see if anything else needs changing i thought we've already done that have really. you done that have yeah. you built it all into this given that this is developed is it all done yeah, sorry, I was trying to put my hand up. Yes, it's all been checked, Chair, uh, before we okay, presented these. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Well, we'll just we'll go for a break shortly. We'll just we'll just have a very quick verbal update from Mike Cook, if we could, on the um, quality committee, because um, the assurance report's coming next month. So just a quick verbal update from you, Mike, and then we'll just have a, a brief uh, break. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sharon. Uh, just a, a very brief update. We did meet on the 10th of February, and the assurance report uh, has been drafted, and also the uh, committee effectiveness report for um, for the whole of the year, um, uh, and they were cleared on Friday. So we felt we'll, we'll bring them to the next meeting uh, by agreement. Um, it was a good meeting. Thanks also for attending, Sharon. Uh, seven of us were there, so uh, please chip in uh, uh, Hillary and John. But we had a fantastic presentation on the uh, autism strategy. And we suggested that comes to the board. Uh, and we were lucky to hear from Clarissa Thompson and Trish Bailey, who really were uh, right on it. And I think it, it was very educational, growing understanding, growing action together with people. Uh, and I, I think it's a really good piece of work. So hopefully that that is going to be programmed. Um, we. Uh, uh, we signed off uh, seven actions uh, from the action log. Uh, there's a good work plan for 21-22 now. And um, we had a, a really good discussion about how effective we've been over the year and what else we want to do. And, and that was uh, participative. And uh, I think um, that that was uh, a really good uh, discussion. Uh, Excellent insight report from Hillary, uh, John, Lynn all playing in, um, uh, thinking about clinical supervision, uh, think about SIs, uh, serious incidents, and also the CQC um, uh, assurance visit. Uh, so all, all, all good there. The vaccination centre briefing was John on, on fire, and we were very, very uh, pleased to hear about that progress and the impact it's having for the system, not just our own um, patients and staff. Uh, a real boost there. Uh, R&D uh, research and development, again, you've seen that at the board. We had a good look at that too. Uh, we also had a good look at friends and family test, uh, ligature, uh, annual report, anti-ligature work, um, the risk register, and uh, one policy, which was the immun immunisation and vaccination policy, which have approved today. So uh, a lot going on. We'll meet again on the 7th of April. I think it would be good to just segue back the um, commissioning piece uh on collaboration so that i don't think we've got much of a role hillary is on that uh, group but it, it would be useful just for us to make sure we keep an eye on that and very happy to look at the audit draft audit program as well if, if people would like us to uh, uh, that that's a summary it was a really good meeting and, and thank you very much for it sorry we didn't get the report out in time it was workload genuinely um and uh uh, thank you to Hilary and John for 
and and Lynn for their support of the committee and my non-exec colleagues. Anything else people want to add? John, Hillary, anything? I mean, the report will be coming next month anyway. Anything you want to add? Not no. from my perspective, no. Thank you. Mike Smith, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, it was a good meeting, as the, the chairman said. Um, and the uh, the autism strategy, I, I'm glad that's coming to the board because that changes the narrative regarding autism and, and was certainly an exercise for me in terms of understanding the concept of neurodiversity. Um, and we really are leading on that agenda um, and we can help change things. As Michelle points out, if we can get this into the system, and then this is really helpful as learning for all of us. Uh, on the legacy report, um, we, we did have one um, thing that, that do, does need action, and that's the timings. We've got a, a list of, of ligatures um, that we need to look into, but we need to pull those into timings because the CQC is certainly saying there should be some NED awareness of that. And I know that's work in progress, uh, but generally a very good meeting and thank you to the executive team. Thanks, Mike. So, if the, and the, obviously, there will be a, there is a recommendation from the Quality Committee for the Autism Strategy to come here to board. Is the board happy to do that? And then we can work with Jenny to um, agree a time for that. Yes, Jenny, can we pick that up as an action then, please? Thank you. Well, thank you all. I think we'll take a break there. We've finished the assurance report, so we'll have a 10 minute break back at 11.30. Um, Adam, if that's OK, if you could action that. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much and we'll carry on if that's okay. So if we could go to item 15, which is the COVID report, Lynn. Yes, thank you, Chair. So a familiar report template now, I'm sure, for you all. So I guess in January, um, the position that we saw is that obviously we've maintained our emergency planning command arrangements. Very recently, we have reduced the frequency that gold and silver tactical meet as pressures have been improving, particularly as the infection rates have been reducing across all of our areas. So gold command now meets once a week with the ability to step it up, obviously, if necessary, silver tactical meets once a week. Um, but silver um, operational is continuing to meet three times a week currently. During January, as the report describes, the operational pressures in some areas did remain high, um, particularly actually in our Scarborough and Rydale community services, and that was related to um, high infection relate, uh, rates um, impacting uh, COVID-related admissions to the acute hospitals, and obviously the requirement that we support the system overall, particularly in supporting discharges, timely discharges from the acute hospital. Um, in February, those pressures have reduced now. Um, again, through January, we continue to see sort of high demand across mental health, particularly our crisis services, the mental health liaison, and demand for beds um, overall. We also saw some pressures in primary care through January, and I guess that's not surprising given that primary care were also delivering the COVID vaccination programme, as well as maintaining their business as usual pressures too. So our um, response obviously has been to support those areas where we needed to, which indeed we did. Um, Michelle's already touched on as well that we're also responding to um, national and regional pressures, particularly around um, CAMS and CAMS Tier 4 beds. So in response to that, Michelle's already talked about, she's leading to work across our ICS, bringing the providers together to really look at what we can do to support that pressure um, across our system. So one of the things that we're doing is looking at the opening of the um, two um, of the PICU beds um, at Inspire. So our intention is to have at least two of those beds operational in March. So working on that at the moment, we have introduced a um, home treatment element to the um, CAMS crisis um, offer. And we also are working on the eating disorder pathways for the reasons that we talked about earlier. Through January, we did see, which was really positive, a reduction in the number of COVID positive patients across our inpatient areas. So we did see a position where we had um, zero patients for a little while, and that has increased a little bit, actually. So we've got three um, COVID positive patients as of today. Our sickness absence rate did reduce um, during January and in February, probably a little bit more slowly in January than we perhaps would have liked to have seen, but it certainly is reducing now. So that's really positive to see. However, that does mean that we continue to maintain that focus on staff health and wellbeing for the reasons that we've touched on already today. Our staff obviously are still tired. It's still the highest risk on our COVID related risk register at the moment. So, and I think particularly as we start to recover as well, you know, as people process the psychological impact of what they've worked to live through over recent months. So anticipating really that that psychological um, health wellbeing support will be needed from us for quite some time yet. Through Steve's team as well, there's a focus on thinking about our offer in relation to long COVID. So there's already some um, support in place, but how can we build on that going forward as well? Um, in relation to um, COVID vaccine, obviously I'll let John um, talk about that, but focus really on sort of preparing for um, second dose of the vaccine. We have maintained obviously our lateral flow testing, still expecting our staff to um, report their results, which indeed they have been doing. And obviously that maintained focus on, you know, despite the improving position, that it's really important that the um, back to basics, social distancing, the wearing of PPE, and, and ensuring that our staff are continuing to follow that guidance, even though though, you know, the, the pressures are reducing um, to some degree has been sort of, sort of key messages for us over the last month. So I'll pause there, Chair, and obviously open up to any questions. 
Thanks, Lynn. And I, I have to say, Lynn, it's, it is a comprehensive report, but it is a very valuable report and it's a good report. So thank you for doing it. I realise it takes a lot of putting together, but I think it's really important that we get it. So thank you for that. Uh, John, do you want to add anything about the vaccinations before we take question? Uh, so just to say, we're, we're apart from the planning for round two, we're focusing on the 15 percent of colleagues um, who've been hesitant about stepping forward and um, just trying to understand some of that. So we've surveyed them. Um, and we sort of understand a little bit of um, what's going on. It, it, it's partly related to fears about long term side effects and um, some issues related to fertility. Um, and so what we're doing is we're, we're just continuing to liaise with, with, that, with our colleagues around that one, making it easy for them to get vaccinated at the Mass Hub Centre. Um, but that's what we've learned from so far. But look, we're pretty happy with the state of play so far. And I think that number who've been vaccinated would slowly, surely be creep up, particularly as we start to vaccinate in round two. Um, so we will go from sort of 80 to 85 percent, if not a little bit higher, which I think overall will be a pretty positive result. Um, we do understand where the challenge is in terms of people who haven't come forward, and that's primarily in our bank workforce. Um, who are a lower vaccination rate than the substantive. Um, and we, we've made really great progress um, with our BAME colleagues, which has actually booked the national trend. So um, still work to do, but happy with the progress, but focusing on the people who still to come forward. Thanks, John. And it won't be long before it's the second round, will it? So um, soon be with us. Uh, Steve? Thanks, Sharon. Um, and thanks, Lynn. It's a really good report. I, I, I guess just an observation, really, is, is as we as we sort of transition through this and we get into what we're terming the kind of recovery stage, I think it's just that kind of consideration that we give to allow our staff to recover. And we, we touched on some of this in the workforce committee the time before around what the potential impact may be on staff as a result of what they've been through over this year so and that could manifest itself in a number of different ways it could 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 be a higher sickness rate it could be a higher turnover rate and just making sure that we're doing everything that we can to uh try and foresee that and put things in place to mitigate against it and uh, it, th this may be this may be for another time as a board that we do some reflection on it, but I think it feels like we've done this part of it really well. We're about to enter into another phase and wouldn't it be fantastic if we did that second phase as well as we've done this first phase um, moving forward for our staff. Thanks, Dave. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, Peter first, please. OK, th thanks, uh, Sharon. And, and we've, uh, we've had a really good report again on, on COVID, a lot of assurance there. I just I just was really wondering, um, given that Boris Johnson has, has mentioned that it's 21st of June um, date, um, wh whether or not we need to, I'm sure you are, think, thinking of a plan for return to sort of actual physical work for, for maybe corporate staff more than anybody else in, in terms of what, what that balance would look like. Um, for, for someone in, I don't know, the accounts department, say, in, in go, going back to work, what, what would they still be able to work from home? What would the mixture look like? You know, how, how would how would life, what would life look, life look like for that person in perhaps August, September or whatever? And, and the other part of the question really is, give, given this date, these dates, um, it seems to me that there have been an awful lot of staff are suddenly wanting to go on holiday all at the same time and I just wanted to know, um, you know how are you how are you going to manage that that sudden demand for, for, for staff going on wanting to go on holiday perhaps this summer all at the same requesting the same dates and, and, and you're going to possibly be letting some staff down so you know how, how are you going to deal with that? Uh, both good questions and I'm sure the staff would like the answers as well so and um, Michelle's got a hand up so I'll come to Michelle first please. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, Pete. Probably remiss that we didn't mention actually that the corporate piece of work. We, we did put it in the EMT brief. I mean, first of all, touching on Steve's point, if it, we did we did mention that earlier on that we are going, we are doing a piece of work at the executive on the next stages for 
health and well-being and the extension of proud etc but also what we do going forward because yes we do want to continue to be ahead of the curve and, and support our staff which we've been doing all the way through I think the holiday is a good one I think that comes down to managers to make sure that they're absolutely monitoring managing staff I think the other thing is that you know if people don't get the holiday do they go off sick so I think we just need to, to monitor that and I know that Lynn and the team and Silver have got that um, and having conversations about that already we have been quite strict in relationship to people carrying leave over um, because this has been going on all year and we've wanted people to take breaks throughout the year so we are you know maintaining that 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 policy that you know people shouldn't be taking massive amounts of, of leave over unless there's exceptional circumstances um i think they really this is a really good point for the 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 roadmap i think we need to be careful it depends on figures um and um, of one, how the vaccinations progress, but also the figures as well. The figures in this area are still high. Um, it, they're not converting as much into inpatient admissions, which is great, but they still remain relatively high, certainly in the Yorkshire region, but, but certainly in pockets in Hull and East Riding. So I think we just have to be mindful of that. But we are working towards that. I think what we said all the way through, really, is that we don't anticipate everybody going back to completely what normal ever looked like before so we don't anticipate a mass in incidence of people coming back into the organization and certainly i mean i do still dip in and out of every team meeting and still there's a a real um understanding of stuff now they're getting used to it once the children are back at school it makes it a bit easier actually they don't want to come back to office full-time they want that social contact it's one of the things that emt talk about regularly they want that social contact so we are doing a piece of work which i'll pass over to pete actually which, we, which we've agreed at emt to do to actually maybe change our um, HQ offering into more of a well-being centre. I think um, um, uh, John, it was John's idea, which is a great idea about actually more of a uh, health and well-being centre rather than a HQ in its current guise, so that we do want staff to be flexible. So, Pete, do you want to just say what we're doing in relationship to that and the timelines of that? Yeah, of course, well, Michelle. So, most of you will recall we decoupled Trust HQ from the inpatient redesign project probably about a month to six weeks ago. So we're running a separate exercise with a little bit of support from City Care, engaging with each of the directors and the deputies in terms of what their long-term vision is for a future working model. You know, So there's a lot of ways floating around agile, remote, home working, et cetera. That will then result in a, a kind of an outcome that will come to EMT. We did discuss at EMT on Monday and you know, very much, we talked about like a wellbeing or a creativity hub for people to come in and work. So not a traditional, office environment that, that we've had in the past but we just need to run that process timeline is an update to emt in march and then kind of a final outcome from the project in april which would then dictate what our future corporate accommodation offering may look like and i think i'll, I'll stop there for now michelle okay thank you really helpful uh, john is it on this point or another one it is okay yeah. you can come in please so um, just to, to build on Michelle's um, point about the, the roadmap, um, and Peter, you mentioned the 21st of June. Um, what I would be saying is, um, and I think most of the medical experts and nursing experts will be saying this, um, that we're not safe as a country until everyone has been vaccinated, and vaccinated means you've had two shots, and we certainly won't have reached that from a national point of view by the 21st of June. Um, in the, some of the um, independent SAGE guidance, which is in the public domain, it does suggest that there are risks of a fourth wave um, reappearing in later winter. So I think what we at all as EMT agree, what we want some form of return to normality, um, actually this new paradigm that we're living in, in terms of infection control and social distancing, um, it is going to be as important as ever going forward. And I'm just slightly hesitant and reticent about the idea that the 21st of June um, is going to be like a, a victory day, so to speak, because um, as Michelle mentioned, um, the figures in terms of infection rates and stuff um, would suggest that we just need to be uber cautious. And that's the message we will be sending to our colleagues in comms. Um, and that's the message which I'll be sharing with public, um, because I think we get one chance to get this right. Um, and if we end up with vaccine escape because we haven't done it right, we we're back in the mire in six to nine months time. So I don't want to rain on too many parades, um, but I, I think there has to be an element of caution with regard to some of this. Thanks, John. That's really helpful. Steve, is your point on this or is it a different one? Because I've got Dean waiting, but if it's on this one, I'll bring you in now. It's OK, no, no, go, go to Dean. 
Thank you very much, Steve. Dean? Thanks, uh, Sharon. I, I guess it was just to sort of echo uh, Steve's point, isn't it, as our minds turn to that sort of um, uh, recovery of, of staff and what it does look like. And um, I mean, there's some great stuff has been going on, hasn't it, in terms of supporting staff too. And um, I think nationally, sort of regionally, you know, different organisations are talking about the importance of staff having a bit of R and R. I think John, in the past, you've talked about that sort of, uh, you know, the, the sort of army analogy of a, a you know, a return from a tour of duty and getting some sort of time. And I know we've done things with annual leave, but um, it, it's going to be different for different staff, isn't it? So we, we'll have got some staff that have you know, not been working at home, <laughs> uh, that they're coming into work, working on wards, doing sort of PPE and, and not had that um, sort of sense of, uh, uh, you know, doing something different. And, and, and I, I don't know whether it's, uh, you know, something through the workforce committee about whether there's a, a paper for us to consider about, you know, here's some of the sorts of options and the risks, here's some of the operational implications of those. Uh, what are the sorts of things that we, we might be prepared not to do or to let slip? As a result of allowing some of that, you know, do we allow, um, you know, back to Peter's point, I suppose a counter of that is, you know, could we cope with more staff taking leave than we would normally do if we did some things differently? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not proposing anything. I'm, I'm just sort of conscious, I guess, that, um, you know, getting creative heads on about what does recovery for staff really look like, where we still got to deliver a service, um, you know, is, is, is something I guess a number of people are going to be turning their minds to. No, thanks, Dean. And Steve, you might want to pick that up because um, I'll bring you in now. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, no, no, no. Thanks and th thank you. So, so I think um, I, I think absolutely, and that kind of feeds in. So, I was going to come back to Peter's point around the, the leave. So, you know, one thing that I know some trusts are contemplating is, uh, so you may relax your rules around agency, for example, because you say actually for that period we are going to let as many of our staff take leave where they can, and we might be we might recognise as a financial implication to that because we're going to use some agency, but that balances out a part of recovery. So I think there are some things that we can do as a trust that may be different to help this recovery, which which Dean kind of touched on, and you know happy to happy to do some work and bring that back to the workforce committee if that's what um, we think would be the best way. OK, well, can we leave you to have a conversation, um, you know, execs and, um, and feed it into Dean as chair of that committee, whether that's the most appropriate place to go and when. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, well, so we, can, we, we were discussing it already at EMT, so I think if we filter it through, if we bring it to EMT and then onto the Workforce Committee, I think that, that that would be, and then obviously back to board. Thank you. We'll do it in that way then. Thank you very much. Good conversation. OK, thank you. And thanks, Len, for your report and for everybody for their contributions. If Oliver, thank you for joining us. You've been waiting very patiently. If we can move on to item 16, which is the uh, risk management strategy. As you'll all remember, this came to the board last month and we had a really good discussion about it and made some suggestions. And then Hillary um, suggested it was brought back today. So Hillary, do you want to introduce the paper? Thank you, Sharon. Yes, so um, hopefully you should see from the red um, font in the report that we've picked up on the comments, the feedback that we got. So Oliver I, and I met. It's been to EMT as well. Uh, so we've got, we've got the um, additions there. One of the things we have added is um, around the governance section and we've put the commissioning committee in there as well, just for completeness. But I'll hand over to Oliver so that he can say about the changes that he's done. Thanks, Hilary. Um, yeah, just to echo that point, obviously, it's, it's been through a, another review. Um, obviously, we have updated it in line with the comments last time, which were really useful and gave us some good points to consider. Um, just the key changes to note um, from the previous version, um, distribution channels. Um, Francis, you kind of made a really good point around how we should be sort of distributing the strategy and communicating it out, and we've expanded that and we'll include now an awareness session when we get it approved, sort of launch that with each of the divisions and director areas to make them aware, obviously, the strategy document, what we're trying to achieve over the next three years, and really sort of get their buy-in in terms of the culture and the change to risk management arrangements as part of the work that underpins the strategy. Um, we've made some minor updates to the scope section, which was just to align it a bit more to the patient safety strategy, because ultimately it does go hand in hand with that existing document, and we are trying to echo some of the points um, and some of the, the aspirational targets within that strategy as well linked to this document. Um, in terms of the ambition section, um, we've added some additional actions. Uh, ambition one, um, we've added the specific arrangements around looking at the local and divisional risk management um, systems and arrangements in place. 
um, to ensure that they're responsive and dynamic. So we're sort of learning from what we uh, implemented as part of the Silver Command and Gold Command arrangements linked to COVID. So we really have that sort of dynamic process linked to risk and things are turning around um, a lot quicker and a lot more um, responsive in terms of the issues that we're facing as an organisation. So that was included. Um, we've amended the wording of ambition too, just to include reference to the Trust Commission and responsibilities and obviously then the supporting risk management arrangements linked to that. Um, and obviously then that, that in, includes the incorporation of risks linked to the Hemingway Coast and Vale Provider Collaborative. And obviously those arrangements are being discussed and we'll, we'll have um, those hopefully agreed and, and fully up and running for what, when we come to the Q1 board assurance framework. Um, so we'll have that fully embedded and know exactly what, what our expectations are and what we need to do in terms of reporting to the board. Um, some minor amendments to the um, governance section as well, just to include reference to the capital programme board, a slight expansion of that and reference to the provider collaborative commissioning committee, which Hillary has already mentioned. There is one additional bit which has not been added and apologies for this, but it's in regards to the charitable funds committee. It's an oversight on my part. We just need to include a small sentence just to reference the, the group and obviously they maintain their, role, their own risk register in terms of charitable funds. So that will be added. But everything else, we obviously took on the comments, which are well received. And thank you for the review last time. Hopefully now the document's a bit more fit for purpose and, and gives those elements and a bit more of a, a thought on those additional bits we could do to improve those ambitions. Um, and finally, we've, we've put it in a new trust format as well, um, which was another comment from last time. So hopefully, you know, happy to take any questions or comments this time around, but hopefully it'll, it'll meet the requirements of, of the organisation going forward and provides a good sort of foundation for improving risk management over the next three years. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you for all your work on this. And can I also say thank you very helpfully to highlighting in red. I have to say that was that was really appreciated. So thank you. Any questions or comments for Oliver? No, I think it's pretty self-explanatory and thank you for taking all that on board, Oliver. So we're asked to um, approve, ratify it. Are we happy to do so? Yes. Any dissensions? No. Thank you very much, as always, Oliver, for joining us. Thank you, everyone. So can we please move on to item 17, the Equality Delivery Scheme self-assessment, Steve? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. So submitted for uh, information and approval. It's a culmination of the work that we do, uh, kind of workforce level that my team lead on, and then the kind of patient safety service users, which John and John's team and Mandy do. So we've pulled that together. I think there's a an issue that Peter picked up um, early on the way that the form has gone across because the scoring hasn't come across into the um, uh, using that form from the from the previous template that we've done. So certainly from my areas, the workforce areas that that we've scored or each of them is achieving. The plan is to take that workforce part to workforce committee and and go a little bit deeper into that and in the March meeting. So I can hand over to John for the for the other areas. I'm I'm, I'm assuming John that probably similar plan to do that for for uh, quality committee um in, in some ways there, there's an element of repetition here um because a, a lot of the stuff which is in this will have been discussed at quality committee through the patient care experience reports the quality improvement plans brought together and um, by the divisions and stuff so um it, this is in some ways a helpful form as an aid memoir to bring it, bring it all together. Um, but I think it just captures, brief, it's almost like a brief summary of all of the annual reports that we've produced in the last six months and covers stuff off. So it's a helpful submission, um, but I, I think it's sort of, it's not helpful in some ways, bearing in mind the quality of the other reports that we produce, which go through committees and actually come up to board as well. Thank you both. Um, any questions or comments on this? No, Steve, can I just ask, and apologies if I missed it, um, I did attend the last one, but are we planning on having um, uh, an EDI annual virtual event this year, or are we carrying over last year's priorities? Or Because it's always been linked, doesn't it, with the patient and care experience work as well in the past. Yeah, it's always been dri driven by Mandy, so uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure because Mandy usually runs that. John, is that something that you're aware of? Um, no, I, I suppose there's something about thinking about EDI in the round, isn't there, with regard yeah. to workforce and with regard to patient experience and with regard to ops. And um, it may, maybe it's something to consider at some sort of digital conference later on um, and sort of looking out, but also sharing some of the stuff that we're collectively doing. Um, but as I said, I think this template just brings a lot of that together here, Chair. Thank you. 
No, that's fine. It's just it refers to the last event, that's all. And I, I was very impressed at the last event because I think it was the first time we would asked our staff and other people to choose priorities, um, what we were doing. So I thought that was very powerful. So that's why I was asking yeah. whether we were planning another one. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, no, I mean, I think we should be planning another one if we're not, because it was really positive last year and it was a positive move in relationship to engagement. So I will leave that with the execs. Thank you. I'll, we'll leave that um, with the execs to have a look at yeah. doing that. But it was a really good event last year and I think it was a really positive step forward for the trust that, as I say, we weren't just doing it ourselves. We were actually asking our staff and others what they thought the priorities should be. And so much has happened since then. Um, absolutely. So yeah, thank you. I, so I think absolutely, Sharon, we can, we can settle and I agree with Michelle, we, we, we can do that. And around, of course, this time we're further developed now with having our disability network up and running, our BAME network up and running as well. So I think, as Michelle says, we've got that, we've got that group plus our networks. So we're in such, a, we, we're so f much further on on this in, in doing proper engagement about set, what we're, what we're, um, we're reflecting on our performance and setting our objectives going forward. So uh, yeah, great idea. I'll make sure that Mandy and John are picking that up. Brilliant, thank you. So if there's nothing else we're asked to approve it, are we happy to do so? Yes, any dissensions? No, it's duly approved. Thank you very much, Steve and John. If we move on to item 18, which is the Mental Health, Health Act white paper, John. Um, so th this is just um, coming to board and um, to share with people for information. I, I think Mike described it as um, trying to eat an elephant and um, cutting it off in, um, in little bits, which um, we've just outlined some of the plans earlier on through the Mental Health Legislation Steering Group. Um, it, 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 you know, it, it's a huge white paper. Um, I just point you to some of the language in it. Um, it's interesting, we've talked a lot about closed cultures here, um, which is the direction of travel, which the language of the CQC have been using. And actually it's language I like, the closed cultures. That doesn't quite appear in the white paper. Um, I think we, we all realise there's huge challenges facing um, mental health over the next few years, not just because of COVID, but because of other societal changes. Um, I think changes in the act may help some of that, but likewise changes in the Act may increase some burdens of bureaucracy. And if that's the case, that may create increased workforce challenges going forward. So, um, you know, this is a consultation period. Um, I think it gives everyone the opportunity to submit to those consultations. Um, and then we'll just um, await events, basically. Thanks, John. It's a useful paper. Any questions, comments? Michelle Hughes? Thank you, Chair. So the white paper has been shared via email with board previously for comment, but it is an action on the board action log. So just to confirm in terms of uh, timing and process, as referred to earlier, the Mental Health Legislation Committee is setting up some task and finish groups um, and are working through the various elements of the paper. The plan now is that that will come back, the draft report will come back to EMT, who will then add their own comments and finalise a draft before it then goes to board in full for final comments. So it will eventually come through, but there's a process in place to get the best draft version uh, before that's shared. Mike Smith. Can, can we, Michelle, just put a Mental Health Legislation Committee in that loop, even if it's virtual, uh, just to circulate it around before it just appears at board? Yes, of course. Mental Health Legislation Committee are actually uh, developing the first draft of the various elements that will then come as a composite draft to EMT. So they're very much linked in and are the driving force with clinicians and operational managers for the various elements of the white paper. Thank you. OK, that sounds that sounds like a good sort of process, Michelle. I know you've circulated it around the board for comments already, and I think um, I think a couple of the governors have expressed an interest in seeing the board submission when it goes in. So um, I've, I've emailed John about that. John? Yeah, okay. can I just a note of caution here? Um, bearing in mind everything that's going on, it is a white paper. We're being asked to submit some information for consultation and that, you know, whatever we do is kind of, you know, captures some brevity and some important points, but we don't turn it, dare I say, into a huge um, bureaucratic industry, bearing in mind everything that's going on. You're getting a thumbs up from Mike Smith on that, John, so that's fine. Um, so um, we'll leave the process uh, with you and Michelle Hughes uh, to go through the system, but thank you for that. And as I say, Michelle, we're all aware that you've, you have sent it around the board already, so thank you for collating that. Okay, if we can move on then to um, 
the final item, which is item 19, which is integration and innovation. And I've got both Michelle's down for this one. So um, does one of you like to just talk to the paper? Michelle, do you want to just guide us through it? I think I think basically, for, from my point of view, this isn't anything that we've not talked about before. This is about the development of the ICS and the removing of bureaucracy from the system and having an integrated care system that meets the needs of its population, built around inequality and coterminous boundaries with local authorities. So if there's anything in there for, for me that we've not talked about, it's about being accountable, more joined up. And it's bringing together um, all the different partners. So in a way, it's what the ICS integrated care system in Humber Coast Vale has been doing for a while, putting it on a more statutory footing and removing the commissioning from, you know, GP commissioners in CCGs into more of a play space. Obviously, the devil's in the detail. It's about making this framework work for Humber Coast and Vale and our population. I think two of the things that were absolutely wedded to is that wrap around care and integration care but also about um not having lots of different um organizations vis-a-vis -vis commissioning to make it more place and more um aligned to um, health inequalities which links into our strategic direction as an organization and links into our portfolio and the work that we've been doing um with our partners and our stakeholders around so i'll finish that for a minute and then i'll let michelle just just take you through just some of the main items that she would ever want to just draw out um, of the paper as well. Thank you. I think Michelle's covered the main points. I mean, it's been a really busy time for consultations and this paper actually highlights three. There's the white paper and two others and the three of them we've, were published on the um, same day. So quite a lot of um, uh, 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 documents and detail to go through. So the white paper itself, it has been shared with board previously um, and it does build on, um, it does include a response to the pandemic and building that into um, the way forward. Um, the, the, it's, it's important to note that the timing of this um, subject to parliamentary business is that it will be implemented next year so not a lot of time to work through all of this and, and set it up to implement but it is there hell of a lot of detail i won't go through it but um the white paper is just one of the documents the legislation legislation for ics there are five key recommendations and they're clearly set out in the paper there I won't read them because I'm sure board members have. And then finally, there's a consultation on proposals for a provider selection regime. And that consultation is out until the 7th of April. So lots going on. The purpose of the paper is to draw those out to highlight the published documents so that board have the opportunity to A, be aware and to B, discuss the contents and to note the timing for the proposals to be implemented. We are putting together a response to the consultation on the provider yeah. selection regime. So if you have got any comments, please send them to Michelle. And that links into some of the work of the provider collaborative that we spoke about already and the provider collaborative work that, that we're doing um, in the organisation. I think for us, the implications are you know, both challenging, but also a real good opportunity in relation to working with our, continuing to work with our stakeholders, service users, staff, and building on the really good work from a, a COVID point of view, which we've already spoken about at board today which is about that mutual support from organizations both for us to mutually support other organizations and other organizations to help us as well so i think for me it's about building on on that that joint work and the partnerships that we've developed but from an organizational point of view i think it builds its challenges but it also brings its positivities as well i know you've got some hands up chair so i'll leave it there no thank you very much so michelle just for ease for board members would you mind doing what uh, what you've done with the other um the mental health act just sending an email around asking them to respond to you on that one as well the provider selection piece as well if that's all right it's okay. just it'll say it'll save them going through the couple of hundred pages of the board papers to find the link that's fine uh, dean you put your hand up yeah, thanks very much and, and thanks michelle for the uh the summary on the uh on the white uh, paper i just wondered just on the um uh, some of the key points is, is is whether it's just worth uh, highlighting that one of the key things that the white paper does is sort of get rid of that section 75 competitive tendering aspects i think that has so beset mental health services and fragmented services uh, to the sorry state in many cases it is now where we've got you know a lack of sort of joined up care um so i think that's very sort of welcome uh sort of moving the white paper to uh you, you know uh 
uh, put put that in place the only way it's going to make sort of sense to do so uh, for improving um, uh, patient uh, services and uh, and I suppose the corollary of that uh, for us uh, might be about um, that thought that we give into um, place versus ICS level commissioning around sort of mental health services if we were to get truly joined up services across the patch so uh, I know it's still sort of uh, in discussion as it sort of develops through the uh, uh, the ICS but uh, I think that loss of um, you know the, the the change to the tendering stuff I think is good for patients and it's certainly good for staff who have for years have uh, had that sort of uncertainty of whether services will be transferred from one provider to another and what it means for them so I think that's that's uh, good and positive news. I completely support that and, and I think obviously we've still got the local authority aspects of tendering which I think still being worked through the various systems but you're absolutely right I mean poor staff have just gone from provider A to provider B, provider B to provider A, provider A to provider B for years and, and that, that that's not healthy but I also think it, it came, I think tendering came in at a time when we probably needed to do a bit of that and from a productivity efficiency wise but I think we've outgrown that as an NHS I think it's really good and we've already started to touch on that as an organisation for example the provider collaborative not what we've talked about earlier on, but the collaborations that we've been doing with some of the transformation monies that's coming for mental health, particularly like, for example, perinatal, where we've been working across Humber Coast and with other providers, the development of the Resilience Hub, for example. So I think there's already some really good pockets of where providers are coming together now, not to compete, but to say, well, well, there's this pot of money. How best do we utilise it for the populations that we serve? And I think that has to be healthy. And that's obviously part of the work that I'm looking at across from the coast of Bill, but I think for our organisation, I think that's really healthy because obviously we were subject to a lot of that being a community and a mental health provider, um, you know, in the past. There is still this decision about where Section 75 contracts currently sit going forward if they, you know, are innovated or, or, or whatever. But again, it's the devil's in the detail and we haven't got that technical guidance, but I think you're absolutely right, Dean. And also the cost of doing that tendering as well. So it's not just... I don't think benefits in patients, but it's also and the staff. Has, it's also the cost of of organisations to that industry in relationship to feeding the tender processes and what have you. So yeah, really good point. Yeah, thank you, thank you all. Okay, so uh, if we just go to the last item, which is the yeah. items for escalation. Um, I don't think we've got any, unless anybody's got anything to raise. So with that, we will close the, uh, oh, well, sorry, any other business? I'm not aware of any. Has anybody got any other business? No. So we'll close the uh, meeting in public. Um, thank you very much to anybody who's been watching virtually um, and stay safe and well. And Adam, if we could stop the live streaming and if you could confirm when that's done, please.